Welcome back, everybody. And to those of you that are just joining us, welcome. Our next panel, which is hosted by Eliza Vorenberg and Nicole Jaslowski, will provide some necessary background information on a study done by the National Center for State Courts on Rhode Island self-represented litigants. Please note that we will be discussing and referring back to this study throughout the remainder of the afternoon. Um, as before, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. I am now going to turn it over to Eliza and Nicole. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome and uh, thank you, Whitney. Uh, thank you so much, Danielle and Zach, for joining us for this short panel to introduce the uh, NCSC study um, that you were both in charge of. Um, and thank you, Nicole Dishlevsky, for um, joining me as a co-moderator of this panel. Um, I'm just going to quickly, did, Nicole is Director of Special Programs, Academic Affairs here at RWU Law. I'm going to do a quick introduction of Danielle and um, Zach. Uh, Danielle is the Managing Director of the National Center for State Courts, sometimes referred to as NCSC. Uh, she has a professional focus on access to justice initiatives. She leads several large national access to justice projects for NCSC and serves as lead staff for the $11 million eviction diversion initiative and the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators Access and Fairness Committee, the Post-Pandemic Planning Technology Supergroup and the Blueprint for Racial Justice's Improving Diversity of the Bench, Bar, and Workforce Working Group. In addition, Danielle is the co-creator and a co-host of Tiny Chats. Welcome, Danielle. <laughs> Zach Zarno is a Principal Court Management Consultant with the National Center of State Courts. He is working on national level initiatives to increase access to justice, including working with various court systems to improve the experience of self-represented litigants through process improvement, technological innovation, and system change. At NCSC, Zach is the co-creator and a co-host of Tiny Chats, which you should all look into, offering free, digestible, and creative short-form educational videos on topics about access to justice. He was also instrumental in securing $11 million in funding to support the eviction diversion initiative and in its design staffs the CCJ COSCA policy committee and has authored numerous reports and resources on access to justice topics, including several interactive tools. I'm so happy to see the two of you again, having spent a long uh, Zoom call with you a couple of years ago. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole just to get us started. Thanks, Lise. Wow, the two of you sound really impressive. Um, <laughs> whenever I hear someone's bio, it's like, wow, I'm meeting some like access to justice celebrities. So thank you so much for being here. They don't fact um, check those things at all. You can just say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, might, we might, well, I might have. <laughs> Liza, I'm sure, fact checked everything. Um, Danielle and Zach, you were the principal court management consultants on a 2021 report prepared under a State Justice Institute grant award to the Rhode Island Administrative Office of State Courts. You both work at NCSC, which is an independent nonprofit court improvement organization providing research, education, information, and consulting for advancements in the administration of courts. Your report assessed current efforts to provide court users with meaningful, equal access to the judicial process in the state of Rhode Island. The focus of the assessment was on the effectiveness as, of assistance provided to self-represented litigants, sometimes called SRLs. The purpose of this report was to document self-help practices and NCSC's observations and findings and to provide recommendations for access to justice services that align with proven best practices and protocols for assisting those litigants who are underrepresented. Uh, so my first couple of questions, and either of you can jump in on this, um, can you talk about the impetus for the project and a little bit about the process of researching and writing this report? So why don't, um, I'll start, Zach, and then um, you can take all the things that I inevitably forget. So first, I want to, I think on behalf of both of us, we want to thank Nicole and Eliza for having us. 
Um, it's a delight to, to be with both of you again. I know we have talked, as, as you mentioned before, about the underlying report, but it's a treat to be here and with all of you at Roger Williams. Um, so the National Center, um, we are part of the team that is, does consulting work with courts across the country. And so we do consulting as an organization from everything from case flow management projects to uh, space audits, um, to uh, family triage, to backend case management systems and, and everything in between. Um, Zach and I have a particular focus on really thinking about the needs of self-represented litigants, of liter litigants with low literacy or limited English proficiency um, and making sure that the courts, especially on the civil side where we focus most of the time um, understand what's going on, have procedural fairness, um, and that we can embed the system with as much equity and, and fairness as we can. Um, so we do a number of different consulting projects with courts across the country. And so um, the Rhode Island judiciary was really interested in taking a hard look at um, what was going well and what was challenging as it relates to self-represented litigants across the judicial branch. And so um, the project had a number of different iterations before it got to us um, that the pandemic messed up, um, just related to looking at e-filing and then e-filing pro like preempted the, um, the process because of the pandemic. But by the time we got to the project, it was really to take a hard look at self-represented litigants, where are the pain points? How can the courts do better? Um, and what are tangible things that um, the courts could do out of a commitment to continuous improvement? And to do this, we talked to several dozen stakeholders, several, several dozen stakeholders from places like the court administrator's office, the technology center at the court, the folks in the clerk's office, people who worked in the superior court or the, the um, law librarians, public librarians. Um, we talked to people at Roger Williams University School of Law. We talked to people in the Bar Association, people in uh, domestic violence coalition and advocacy groups, including legal aid. So we, we try to really reach out to as many of those people and stakeholders that have an interest in the courts and work with the courts regularly to get their thoughts and feelings and opinions on this as we crafted the report and thought up recommendations. Great, thank you so much for that background. So based on your research, um, can you describe the findings of the report and the obstacles for self-represented litigants that you found in Rhode Island specifically? Sure, yeah, so we, it's, it's a fairly comprehensive report and we, we found stuff that didn't surprise us, didn't surprise the court and is not unique to Rhode Island. We, we saw that there are some challenges here that many courts are facing for a variety of reasons from uh, lack of resources to uh, you know day-to-day -day operations that can take precedent sometimes over the space that's required to take that step backwards. And so I think a lot of what our role is, is to be an outside observer and to really offer the court that perspective. And, and frankly, they deserve credit, I think, for asking us to come do that. It's not an easy thing to ask an outside group to come sort of take a look at how you do business and offer you advice on how you can do it better. So, but that's what we try to do. And so there's, Eight numbered recommendations, um, you know, a, a lot of them, as you will see from our background and Danielle's introduction, won't surprise you in that they're focused on self-represented litigants. Things like increasing the number of resources available, um, collaborating with referral providers, thinking of ways to um, give self-represented litigants a little bit more guidance as they navigate the system, not legal advice, but guidance on how the process works prescription pads, um, you know, working structurally to set up committees or find staff or make sure that the court is, is mindful of the needs of self-represented litigants. And then really taking a look at all the legal information they produce currently and think about ways that can be improved or audited or, you know, just updated and refreshed given the new online and hybrid environment where people now have access to things both in printed form and on remote and online forms. And I think the only thing I would add is um, that we got really valuable information both from within the court system about pain points they were seeing in specific processes, but we also got really valuable insight from um, community 
participants in, or members of the public in Rhode Island and public librarians and, and um, nonprofits about pain points that um, court users were experiencing and confusion that further um, underscored the need for things like improved communication, um, website content, et cetera. So um, what I think was nice about this was it was a 360 degree scan of the courts, both within the courts, but also outside of the court system about um, how people experience it. Thank you. Um, Zach, can you just clarify what you mean by prescription pads? Sure. Um, it's sort of a fun term that we use. Um, really, the idea here is when you are using the court system as a self-represented litigant, you're under a variety of stressors. Uh, it's a complicated system. You're probably dealing with a legal issue that's very important to you that can have grave consequences. And so while you might be able to read something or have a clerk tell you something, uh, it's hard to keep in, in mind and keep track of all the things you need to do. So we, we really like the idea of something that's cheap and easy to implement for the courts, and that it's really useful and tangible for a self-represented litigant. So imagine a doctor writing a prescription and handing it to you. You don't have to remember the name of that drug. You don't have to, you know, it's, it's just kind of there in your hand. And so the idea is similar to that, that if you go to the clerk's office and they say what you need to do is you really should call legal aid or you need this form to just check a box or write it down or have some kind of takeaway document that a person could can bring with them to that next step. Um, so it's a little bit of a record for them as to what they've done and what they need to do. And it kind of takes the temperature down a little bit because you can hold on to that, you can look at it, you can refer back to it, you don't have to remember every single detail in a moment in your life when you're probably under a lot of different stresses. And the other thing, um, we this is an idea we first stole from Ramsey County, Minnesota but then have worked to implement in a number of different courts across the country, um, both when we were at the center and when we've worked for courts. But um, what's additionally nice about a resource like a prescription pad, although it certainly doesn't have to be that, is it's a wonderful training tool for existing court staff to ensure consistency in referrals because everybody has the same information. Um, but it also can be court-based and community-based. So the way we like to do it is it's a double-sided paper and on one side of the page are court-based resources where you make photocopies, um, where are e-filing stations, where are Zoom rooms if you need them, um, where can I get a copy of my rap sheet, things that you might need um, to complete court business, um, or there court-based resources, does the bar have a referral drop-in clinic, et cetera. And then on the back side of the page could be referrals where you're sending people outside of the court. So um, what are the federal court information? Because if somebody comes in seeking bankruptcy information, for example, having or immigration information, you can know easily where to send them. Um, and then community like bar and legal aid resources or perhaps law school clinics that people should avail themselves to. So it's trying to think really broadly. And then in a couple of communities, um, we've encouraged them to translate those same prescription pads into multiple languages so that at least in your most commonly spoken languages, you have an easy way to refer people to get help. Thanks, Zach and Danielle. Um, I like something you said, which is that the courts should be like sort of lauded and appreciated for holding up that mirror to themselves. As we go through this entire day of really critically talking about access to justice, I think it's important when an organization, a, a, a state organization like really says, hey, let me take a look at what's what might be working and what might not be working because it is easy for people to throw pebbles. It is harder for an organization to take a deep look at itself um, and sort of subject themselves to criticism. Um, but, you know, when there's this sort of difficulty, there's also growth and change. And I think, you know, this is this great example of being on the right path. Um, to expand and improve upon current access to justice efforts and SRL services, your report, as you mentioned, contained this range of recommendations. One of them was greatly increase the number of self-help resources available by utilizing a multimedia approach. And the other, as we just discussed, was creating a prescription pad and or SRL information packet. Can you talk a little bit about those recommendations in particular? Yeah, I can start. I mean, I, I love that we have this multimodal opportunity. There are so many different spaces that we're interacting with court users now that didn't exist in a meaningful way even three or four years ago. 
So uh, Zoom is a great example of that. If someone was waiting, say, for a webinar to start, but you wanted them to find out more about certain information or places they could go look for resources or how to apply to attend Roger Williams University, you have that virtual billboard that's just kind of sitting there. And what we often see is, just please wait, the meeting will start soon. But you can actually modify that and customize that. So that's an example of now that people are interacting with the court for this medium, that space that they own, that they often underutilize and can be utilized in all kinds of ways. It could send people to resources, it could send them to referral partners, it could do all sorts of stuff. Likewise, some people learn best by hearing something, some people learn best by watching a video, some people learn best with a checklist, some people learn best by reading a PDF document. All those are now available, right? They can be hosted online, they can be printed out. You can use a QR code to put on a physical piece of paper, a virtual resource. Someone using a smartphone scans it and they can watch a short video that explains the very form they're looking at, for example. Now, everyone doesn't learn the same way and all these resources aren't right for every person. But if you have a multimedia opportunity and you have a communication need, I, I encourage courts everywhere to think about which ones of these pieces are they using to the best and highest ability of their, of their staff and of the ability of that medium. Um, if we have an interactive place, let's be interactive there. So I just want to touch on what I see as these two different um, parts of how courts can better serve self-represented litigants. The things that you've just described are like litigant facing uh, information um, in different ways of presenting that, different ways of accessing that to try to kind of cover everything. But on the internal side, there are some issues of, you know, arcane language was one of the things that Martha Minow talked about earlier. Um, you know, pr civil procedure issues, uh, things that, you know, no matter how clear the monitor is in the hallway that you're viewing or the or the prescription pad, those things might still trip up a litigant. Or as you said in the report, the, you know, if you don't file that divorce order, you're not actually divorced. Uh, right. So can you talk a little bit about like what we need to do internally in order to facilitate the clear communication um, with litigants who are unrepresented? So I'm really bullish on what I call process simplification, but um, it it's really, um, it's a topic that uh, we really steal from the corporate sector. It's thinking about all the steps in a particular process, um, mapping it out in a really detailed way, and then asking the hard questions about, are all of these steps purposeful and necessary? And is the right person doing it? And is it clear? Um, and then uh, trying to refine as much as possible. So it doesn't mean necessarily eliminating steps, but making sure that the steps that you do have make sense. Um, and I know you have Catherine Alternator on a, a panel a bit later, and um, I learned a lot both from being part of the self-represented litigation network and the process simplification committee that existed um, and may still exist as well. Um, in thinking about this. And so take the family law example, Eliza, that you gave a bit earlier. I mean, if you were to map the whole process, it's clear that for a, at least some percentage of litigants, it was not clear to them what they needed to do. And as a result, um, they weren't getting divorced. Now you can change that by improving the instructions or making it clearer of what they have to do or you can question whether you even need that step. Um, can that happen from the court instead of the litigant? And so my favorite examples of process simplification are where you go back to the spirit of what the step requires and decide how to best achieve that aim. So um, again, you know, for example, in Alaska, I mean, my favorite one 
um, which I hope I'm not stealing Catherine's thunder for later, but like my favorite example is in the Alaska courts, they looked at um, service of process by publication, which to me is a step in all different areas of uh, the law where it doesn't make a ton of sense. I get why we do it. Um, there is something intellectually right about making sure that we don't file, go through a lawsuit where no one has had the opportunity to be heard. On the other hand, publication in a legal newspaper is probably not a fantastic way to meaningfully try to get to someone if you can't find their address. I mean, I am a lawyer in a couple of states. I cannot tell you a single example of a time that I've ever looked in a legal newspaper by in the service of um, publication ever. Um, so I, I have a very hard time believing somebody who isn't an attorney would also go to a daily law bulletin or a weekly law bulletin to do the same. And so um, I think it's an example of a step that we ask litigants to do that is expensive and burdensome. And I don't think it gets what we want. And so what the Alaska court system did is they built a website as part of their court website where they post it. It's still highly imperfect, right? But it gets the underlying point is still there. It is sharing information publicly if you cannot find them, but it's eliminating a cost, a step, and a burden on litigants. And I think there are lots of opportunities in the court system to take a critical eye to what steps might or might not be necessary. What is the true purpose of those steps and does it make sense? And so um, our report kind of scratches the surface in a couple of different examples in different case types of at least initial pain points that bubbled up really quickly. But my guess is any court system across the country, if you were to apply that level of rigor, you'd unearth all sorts of ones. And the last thing I'll say, just while I have the floor and the soapbox, we worked um, in, a, in a Midwestern state looking at a family law process in that jurisdiction and we're gobsmacked to learn, you know, like the, everyone who's in the system is very comfortable in what the system is and what the steps are. But the, fam the divorce process in that jurisdiction had a very rigorous scheduling order requirement that if you did not complete a robust scheduling order about like when discovery was going to be complete and when you were going to exchange all of um, your substantive motions by, if you didn't complete that paper within 90 days of filing, the case was automatically dismissed by the clerk. Um, but the only way you knew such a scheduling order was required was you got a letter in eight point font from the court administrator's office detailing that you needed to do this. Um, and then a separate body just dismiss the case. But you could be in the middle of court ordered mediation while your case got dismissed from under you and none of the entities were talking with one another. So like mediation wasn't talking to the court who also wasn't talking to the clerk's office. And so I guess I say this not because I wanna like, uh, but to say as a way of comparison to Rhode Island, like any jurisdiction, if you apply a really close lens has room for improvement. Um, and so I take it as a really encouraging sign that the judiciary has not only started that process, but also has committed, also Tamara is gonna be on your mm -hmm. next panel too. And you know, like in, in her new role, you're really concretizing someone to really have the institutional muscle, not just to take a snapshot in time, but to really think about how to institutionalize change. Yeah, oh, I love that, thank you. So, Danielle, can I ask a follow-up question? Did you say eight point font? <laughs> yeah, sure. it was outrageous. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Eliza. I just like super wanted to make sure I heard, like, I can't yeah. imagine that is the best practice, but I just wanted to make no, sure. And I, I mean, the whole thing was just written in like blatant and... jargon. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like it was written by and for attorneys who kind of knew how to crank these out. Um, but if you were a self-represented litigant, I mean, you would just ignore it. I mean, the other thing from this other jurisdiction, bash them for a little bit longer, <laughs> um, the process of getting divorced in that jurisdiction, if you had children, was like 16 steps, most of which had to happen physically in person, and they happened to happen during business hours. Um, every single one of those initially was put into place for really good reasons, right? Like we want people to make sure that they um, have an opportunity to mediate, and that they have an opportunity to avail themselves of parental parental education. But when you sandwich it all together, it's 
it's a lot. I mean, especially when a lot of people don't have paid time off, let alone 16 paid days off. And who wants to spend all of your paid time off getting divorced, you know, as opposed to doing other kinds of restorative things too. And so um, I just think courts in general and Rhode Island wouldn't be unique in this sense. Um, really need to think about what are the needs of the court users and is, are every single thing we are doing necessary. I want to just underscore one piece of that very briefly because I, I, Danielle explained the potential and the outcomes and, and why this is important so well. The piece I like also is that it's really kind of easy to do. <laughs> that, that the map of process will be a, a part of a journey towards improving a process or explaining a process, but to actually get a sense of what's going on usually just takes a handful of conversations, which I, I, to me, understanding the financial constraints and the time constraints and the resource constraints that both advocates and courts are under, to be able to do something that powerful and that kind of inexpensively is really worth reminding people as, as a tool. If you talk to someone in this department, someone in that department and someone in that department and compare, you'll very quickly see where there are incongruities and differences and, and misunderstandings and Eventually, when you compile all that and talk to a couple more people, you have a very clear understanding in relatively short time, where are those pain points, which pieces don't make sense, or do they understand that as far as we know, this process has step X, but over here, they don't even know about it. And so you can really get that kind of groundwork done in a manner of weeks. Oh, that's great. Um, so we'll be talking with you about the report and um, your recommendations throughout the afternoon in uh, my panel, uh, the panel that I'm moderating later and, and Nicole is moderating. Um, but we thought it would be good to set the stage a bit for those panels. Um, your report states, ideal general legal and procedural information is written in plain language, end quote, end quote, public facing websites and materials should strive for a fifth grade reading level or below, end quote. Can you talk a bit about why this is important and what you discovered in Rhode Island specifically? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so we, we are huge fans of plain language. Uh, like Danielle, I'm also a lawyer. I never learned Latin. Um, I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that a system designed to facilitate dispute resolution amongst normal people speaks to them like normal people. Anything can be written in plain language and that doesn't mean you're removing context, nuance, or understanding, it just means you're being more precise. Um, we recently created a, a brand new resource actually out like as of last week. If you go to ncsd.org slash plain language, it's a plain language glossary. And I like the framing of it a lot. Our, our colleague Lonnie Summers did a fabulous job on it. It's use this, not that. So don't say forcible entry and detainer because most people don't know what that means. Say eviction. Don't say inform a papyrus because most people don't know what that means. <laughs> say fee waiver, right? I mean, and these are on their face, relatively simple kind of changes that courts can make. And uh, there's some challenges along with those simple kind of examples, but writing clearly, expressing things clearly and understanding who your audience is can really make a difference. Most people using the civil court system in most case types do not have an attorney representing them. So if this was business, you would say, who is your customer? Right? Your court user is, typically a person who is not trained in the law. And if that's the reality of your institution, then you should work to make sure your institution is meeting those customers where they are, which ties back to our earlier conversation about multimodal communication as well. But removing legal jargon, removing legalese, removing Latin, you can quite clearly express all the things you need to express without using any of those. And I think in addition to plain language, and I put the link, someone um, asked oh, for the link, yeah. so I put it in. I don't have the ability to chat it, but it's in the Q&A. If you look to Kathleen's question, you'll see it. But it's just- and we can NCAA send it around right after too, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, but in addition to the content of the page, it's also like white space. And if you can use visuals sometimes, um, really trying to make it both accessible in content and also in the way you process the information. Um, it's so it, the fifth grade reading level, how did you come up with that? Where does that come from? Reading levels are complicated. <laughs> there are multiple yeah. tests and multiple ways to test it. Um, you know, 
I think it's sort of generally accepted that like a, an average newspaper is somewhere in the eighth to tenth grade reading level. Um, so we shot for lower than that, and we think that's really important to, to be mindful again of who your users are. There are a number of literacy studies and, and surveys that have happened in this country throughout the years. I think there've been some quibbles about methodology and about you know representation and all that sort of thing. So I'm not gonna pretend to know more about that than I do, but I will say that for us and our team, we really think about fifth grade-ish. Um, again, you don't wanna lose nuance and you don't wanna lose meaning and you can write very clearly at those levels without doing either of those things. But if the newspaper is probably a little bit aspirational for some people, we think you should be shooting for something below that. Um, just curious, have you seen law schools and or law students um, getting involved in, in these efforts to improve the interface between courts and self-represented litigants? We know of a number of law schools that have design clinics across the country, University of Utah and Stanford and Suffolk come to mind. Um, Suffolk's not exactly design, but um, where, it, well, let's take the University of Utah as an example, where the clinic is really trying to think about how to communicate clearly with legal information um, to Utah, Utah residents um, in a really succinct and plain way. and. Um, they've done a lot of really wonderful examples in a very short tenure. I think it's, the clinic has only been around a year or two. Um, and they have a nice relationship with the Utah judiciary and some of the key staff in Utah who oversee the self-help centers there to develop content. Um, Stanford has a really fabulous legal design lab that has done similar work uh, all over the country. Um, most recently with a focus on eviction, but they've done a lot of different kinds of things like that. Um, I think having outsiders to the courts, but people who are very familiar with that court's processes are an invaluable partner. The access to just justice problems are not gonna be solved by the courts alone. They're going to have to be solved by a much larger community. And so to the degree you have multiple different stakeholders who are able to contribute different things, I think it is all for the good. Um, and I think there is something really helpful about having people who are just themselves learning the law have to figure out how to explain it in a way that would be accessible to them um, or to them you know, two years ago when they're more connected to this being new. It's often a lot harder to get somebody who's been practicing for 20 years to take it back down to a level that would be understandable. The other thing I'll say is a lot of lawyers and court staff like to ensure that they're providing information that addresses the most gnarly, individual, twisted example of something that might happen. They wanna be 100% accurate all of the time. And so if there is 1% of people who need to do it a particular way, then we're going to lay all of it out just in case. And I think most legal information needs to hit the majority of people and that you can, it's totally okay to have a disclaimer that says like, if your stuff is more complicated, like you got to talk to someone like this is, we're trying to hit down the middle. And so I think we have seen really great examples of that. Um, so, and we, one of our most recent colleagues actually is a recent grad from the University of Utah. So we can attest to his incredible acumen. Um, I think much of which got refined while in law school. Yeah, and I think, uh, so back to reading levels and back to sort of process mapping, another piece of that is sort of user testing. So does your document, does your thing pass the mom test or the, your fifth grader test or your neighbor test or your community college student test? Um, just as you can process map relatively inexpensively, you can also user test relatively inexpensively by getting a, a group of people together for a very short time and just saying, what do you think of this? What parts don't you understand? Which parts did you struggle with? Complete this task using the e-filing system or fill out this form correctly to get a fee waiver. And if 90% of them go, I don't know what to do on box X, then you should take a hard look at box X, right? It's, it's very similar to that process improvement thing. But um, so law students are great for that, but I would go to the community college, to the fifth grader, to your neighbor, to your mailman, to your barber, to the person you get your fish from at the grocery store every week, you know, like whoever that person is that you have a relationship where you could just give them something and say, what do you think? 
Um, because as Daniel mentioned, it's hard for those of us in the system to pull ourselves out of it and get that fresh perspective and those fresh eyes or to ignore the, the gnarly situation that happened. And we saw it happen 12 years ago. And so we've been designing everything for that possibility ever since. That, that anecdotal disaster, right? <laughs> like when 90% of the people really just need to know these top three things. I also think it's hugely valuable to the students who are about to go into practice in their on their own yeah. to be able to explain in really concrete ways what a process is or, or what people should do is a skill that will benefit you, whether you work for a court or you have your own practice or you work at a law firm or you're advising um, a corporate business, like being able to speak plainly just kind of will help you full stop. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Nicole, did you have anything else you wanted to? No, I'm excited to get to our uh, afternoon conversations and follow up on all this. Great. So I think our time is almost up. Um, there might be a question or two uh, Nicole and I are both so grateful for the work that you've done here in Rhode Island and the work that you do nationally um, and for your willingness to share this information with us today. Um, now that the stage is set for our future conversations, we look forward to digging into solutions more specifically um, in our afternoon uh, panels. And we're grateful to you for your willingness to participate in more than one panel today. <laughs> Um, so thank you for that. Um, do we have questions, Whitney? So there are none right now, but if anyone has any questions, um, just put them in the Q&A. Um, we have like about five more minutes with Zach and Danielle for right now. Okay. I can put in a quick plug while we wait. This is this is the website where you can find nearly all the stuff we work on. And I'll say it slowly and it's easy to remember it ncsc.org slash A2, so number two, J, like access to justice. So ncsc.org slash A to J. You can find the plain language glossary and other resources there. You can find stuff around remote hearings and hybrid hearings. You can find stuff around appearance rates. You can find our tiny chest. Everything that you'd, you'd want that we spend our time working on it is all there. And so if you're, if you're curious about this stuff, then that's the place to start. Uh, and we hope you are curious. <laughs> um, did, I'm kind did, of, I have okay. I have a question. I'm kind of a fan girl. Uh, can you tell us about Tiny Chats? Exactly. <laughs> uh, what do you want to know? <laughs> I mean, uh, we we do them ourselves in the rooms you're looking at us in right now. We do it over Zoom. It is low budget, which is kind of a theme of ours. We believe that a lot of this stuff you can do scrappy. Um, we dream up ideas together on Zooms or one of us will text the other one and be like, you'll never guess what I just saw on TV and it reminded me of X and now we should do something like that. Um, but really we, from like listening to the courts and talking to folks like you about what is going on, where are their gaps and what do people need and thinking about how we can provide a different way, getting back to the multimodal communication mm -hmm. of conveying some of these topics in a fun and hopefully digestible way um, we're not going to give you everything you could ever need to know in, a, in an eight minute tiny chat, but we'll give you enough to get you started and point you in the right direction. And I will tie tiny chats to Peter's question in the chat about kiosks, which is we did, I think, one of my favorite tiny chats ever about kiosks um, where we were just like, so we're, uh, I'll speak for myself. I am a child of Schoolhouse Rocks. And so um, I, <laughs> wanted to make digestible, interesting information at the beginning of the pandemic that I would want to watch that wasn't a webinar. And Zach is super creative and much funnier than me. And like we made this. And so we have a, an eight minute tiny chat about kiosks that talks about best practices. And we decided to be sea captains uh, in part and also look at a magazine called Sea Captain Quarterly to take essentially a Cosmo quiz about kiosks. Um, and like, I was crying laughing. Zach had like a pipe and a crazy hat at the end and he reads a poem about like sea captain's oath to kiosks. But anyway, if you're at all interested, we can put that in the chat and it's a wonderful teaser into tiny chats should you be interested and you should all subscribe because we send fun goodies too. Yeah, that's a good example of the madness that is a tiny chat. Do sea captains have anything to do with kiosks? 
No, but is it a fun way to convey that? And did we get to dress up and wear costumes? Yes. And really, isn't that what's most important? I love that you're modeling for the rest of us uh, how to communicate um, in sound bites and, and with ease. Um, I'm, I am, I, I, part of me is wondering if there are people in the audience, especially law students who might not know the difference between a kiosk and a help desk and a lawyer for the day. And I'm just wondering if you, you know, could kind of quickly explain what what those differences are and what the spectrum of court-based uh, self-help resources are. Sure, so if you think of like a continuum of, um, in the medical context, like needing medical help from like, I need two Tylenol and call me to the morning to brain surgery. Um, there are different kinds of self-help that courts can provide too. And so the first could be just like static information on your website, right? Like information that you can read whenever you want and look at. And then maybe you don't have access to the internet or you only have it on your phone. And so having a place like a kiosk where you could access the information on the website, maybe you can also e-file if that's permissible or print if you need to write something down. Maybe it's a Zoom room that's in like a soundproof area. So it's a little nicer than a traditional kiosk, but now I can actually plug in headphones and I can participate remotely in my court proceeding, or I can Zoom with a legal advice office. So if I'm in Bristol, but the only self-help center is in Providence, I could Zoom with them. Um, and then, uh, and so, and then to a full service self-help center that might have kiosks or also little Zoom rooms, but also you can talk to a human being who can help you with information. Maybe it's a self-help center that also has legal clinics associated with it. So not only can I get information, but I can also get access to a lawyer for brief advice. And so, or maybe I can get connected to a pro bono lawyer who's going to take my case all the way through. So we're kind of, that would be like the brain surgery analogy, right? Like you'd never want to do that on your own. So those would be in my head anyway, how the continue yeah. would play out for self-help, but. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I think we need to wrap up. Nicole, thank you for being my fearless co-moderator. And uh, Danielle and Zach, thank you so much again. Thank you. Pleasure. See you at the next session. Thank you both. We are going to take a short break. Um, we will be back at 2 p.m. for our next panel, which is our accessibility in the courtroom panel. Thank you. So maybe we'll just get started. I know I don't want, I want to be respectful of, um, my panelists time and um, I'm confident that uh, Judge Smith will, will be able to join us soon. Um, my name is Eliza Vorenberg. I'm Director of Pro Bono and Community Partnerships uh, at RWU Law. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I wanna just say good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am really excited to join this wonderfully knowledgeable and committed group of professionals working in the access to justice space. I also wanna say, of course, uh, that access to the courthouse includes physical and language access, but also access to the necessary legal information and assistance for those without representation. The issues are innumerable and extensive, and we can't possibly cover them all in the next hour or so. Um, so by way of disclaimer, uh, these conversations will continue after today's panel, um, after today's symposium, um, because we could spend weeks talking about them, these issues. Uh, so today we're gonna focus on um, the specific issues that are facing self-represented litigants and those with language barriers and disabilities. And finally, just to clarify, we're going to focus on civil issues um, and, and not criminal. Um, so you heard in the previous panel from Danielle Hirsch and Zach Sarno about the issues that they discovered through the National Center for State Court Study. Let's dig into some of those issues um, and what's being done and can still be done to improve access. 
But first, I'm going to do a brief introduction of our panelists. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tamara. Um, Tamara Rocha Esquire directs the Rhode Island Supreme Court's Access to Justice Office, which oversees the judiciary's compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, the Office of Court Interpreters, and Services for Self-Represented Litigants. As Chief Justice Sattel said in announcing the creation of the office, quote, among the judiciary's challenges that have been starkly evident to me as Chief Justice is the rising number of self-represented litigants in our courts and the need for equal access to justice for our citizens with little or no financial resources in civil matters. Quote, while we often think of equal access as being for those litigants who cannot afford to pay for legal representation, it also includes prompt and effective language services for those who do not speak or understand English, as well as accommodations for people with disabilities. This new office will help coordinate these and other attributes of true access to justice, end quote. And I've had the pleasure of meeting with Tamara, and I'm very excited um, for her new role here um, in Rhode Island. Um, and I'm looking forward to having you on the panel. Um, Danielle Hirsch uh, has a professional focus on access to justice initiatives. She's the managing director of the National Center for State Courts. She leads several large national access to justice projects for NCSC and serves as lead staff for the $11 million eviction diversion initiative and the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators, Access and Fairness Committee, the Post-Pandemic Planning Technology Supergroup, and the Blueprint for Racial Justices, Improving Diversity of the Bench, Bar, and Workforce Working Group. In addition, Danielle is the co-creator and co-host of Tiny Chat, something you should all visit. Catherine Altenator uh, built the Self-Represented Litigation Network. In a into a broad international network of justice system and allied professionals who are creating innovative and evidence-based solutions that self-represented litigants have meaningful access to the courts and get the legal help they need. She now serves as a consulting senior strategic advisor and guides SRLN's many activities designed to grow the justice system, ecosystem, and strengthen each part of the legal help continuum. Before joining SRLN in 2013, Catherine spent her career in Alaska, initially as a trial court law clerk and then as a legal aid lawyer. In 2001, she joined the Alaska court system as the founding director of the nation's first comprehensive phone and internet-based court help center. In 2008, she established a successful unbundled practice and founded the first unbundled law section of a state bar. Well, we would love to have that here. Catherine is a frequent speaker and serves on numerous advisory bodies, including the Advisory Committee for Voices for Civil Justice, Village Capitals, Justice Tech Advisory Board, and the National Center for State Courts, uh, Justice for All Project. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. Catherine received the National Center for State Courts Distinguished Service Award in 2019 for her work to improve access to justice. Nellie Large is a third year law student at RWU Law and she has been a regular volunteer on the eviction help desk in Providence. Prior to law school, Nellie worked as a program assistant at Help USA Home Base. Nellie's career here at RWU Law has included extensive pro bono and public interest involvement. And last but not least, welcome, Your Honor. Welcome, Judge Smith. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, Judge Christopher Knox Smith joined the district court in 2019. Before that, he represented indigent clients facing misdemeanor and felony charges at the State Public Defender's Office. He graduated from RW Law in 27, 2007, 2007 and earned an advanced degree focusing on environmental and natural resources law from the University of Oregon School of Law in 2008. Justice Judge Smith is on the Committee on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Rhode Island Courts. Finally, 
Judge Smith sat in courtroom 3E during the eviction help desk's first year and a half at the district court in Providence and was instrumental in facilitating the introduction of the help desk. And we'll talk a little bit more about the help desk later. Welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to give each of the panelists uh, a few minutes just to make some introductory mark remarks. Um, and I will give you a couple of questions just to think about as you make your introductory remarks. And starting with Catherine, can you give us a sense of civil access to justice in this country? Why so many? Why we have so many unrepresented litigants? Who they are? What are the obstacles they face in accessing justice? And are self-represented litigants disproportionately BIPOC? Why? Um, thank you, Eliza. And thank you to the law school for including me on, on this panel. And congratulations on the initiative that the Law Review has, both for this day and I understand the issue that, that, that you're going to have regularly every year. Um, and to Whitney for all your amazing work getting me here today. And it's a real honor to be together with all of you. Um, I guess you know, part, part of my role here is to help you feel like you're not alone. Um, whatever Rhode Island is experiencing is, is not different from what we see across the country. And the good news in that is that the, many of the initiatives and solutions and interventions and strategies that Danielle and Zach were talking about earlier are, are going to be useful here in Rhode Island. Um, the first, I think one of the first known studies of how many self-represented litigants were in the courts is, I think it was in about 1973, uh, Deborah Rohde, when she was, a, a, I don't even know if she was out of law school yet, um, did an article uh, in Connecticut and the family bench at that point um, docket, and I think it was about 3% or so were self-represented litigants. Fast forward to today, and I, I like to say, depending on case type and location, because we, you know, we sometimes see like rural courts where we will have 100% of the people self-represented in urban courts where we have more resources, we might have less. So depending on case type and location, um, between 65 and 100% of the people in civil matters are self-represented. Um, and I think, you know, we'll talk later about many of the reasons that might be contributing to that. I think as a as a community interested in improving access to justice, the important thing is to just we need to accept it, right? We analyzing the problem of why won't get us to start embracing a system um, that will be inclusive of all people. Um, to give you a sense of proportion, um, the civil legal aid, uh, the LSC grantees, uh, legal aid offices close give or take in a year about seven hundred and eighty five thousand cases a year. The about 80% or more of those cases are um, brief service or advice and counsel. So essentially their clients are self-represented. Um, however, when we look at the numbers for courts and it's very hard to, you know, this is, these are high level guesstimating, right? Uh, because collecting data in courts is very challenging. But when, um, when we look at it, we consistently see estimates of around 30 million people on that the courts are closing cases on self-represented litigants. So this burden is enormous on courts. Um, and I think you know, some of it is for self-represented litigants, financial, you know, supply of lawyers, all of that. But more importantly, this is a moment that lets us reimagine our courts um, and meet our communities right where they are and create courts that are accountable to their communities. Um, and provide services so they are not uh, in a mysterious place. Um, I think we, depending on the community, there can be um, disproportionate representation of BIPOC individuals. Um, and, and of course, that is, that is because of the historical roots in, in this country and, and how resources have been allocated. Um, so I think these reforms and initiatives that we are seeing do contribute to helping give us a more equitable society because these civil cases touch people in their, their most crucial uh, personal situations, their family law, the debt cases, um, housing. So it's, it's a great, it's, it's a big challenge, but a great opportunity. Thank you. Tamara, um, could you describe the Access to Justice Office and the work that you're doing to increase access to the courts in Rhode Island? Yes. Um, can everyone hear me okay? 
Yes. Okay, great. Um, first, thank you again, Eliza, for just having me here and inviting me to be a part of the conversation. Um, I think it's wonderful that we are bringing access to justice to a spotlight and to the forefront. And I think these conversations are necessary and it's necessary to have these conversations as a community as a whole and not just having them um, individually in our own organization. So I really do appreciate you inviting me here today. Um, so a little bit about the Access to Justice Office. Um, as stated, I am the director of the Access to Justice Office here at the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And in that role, I oversee access to justice services, which include language access um, that's offered through our Office of Court Interpreters, compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the expansion of resources and services for self-represented litigants. So we have this beautiful mission here um, where we say that it's our mission to ensure that all court users have meaningful access to the services, programs, and proceedings of the court, irrespective of English proficiency, ability to access counsel, and or um, ability um, otherwise. And so what does this beautiful, elegant um, mission actually mean? And I think for us, it's really about getting to the forefront, getting to the front lines, understanding the needs of our court users and understanding the needs of those who really just want to tell their story. And so when we're talking about the civil side of things, we're talking about people dealing with family issues, like was mentioned, whether it's um, potentially having a loss or the removal of a child or facing eviction matters um, or the loss of property. And so it's really about trying to make sure that everyone is able to fully participate, they're able to tell their story, and how do we do that? Um, the Access to Justice Office has a huge task to take on, and we're excited to take it on. We have developed kind of a four-part approach in order to do this. Um, the first, and what I think is probably the most important, is listening, learning, and observing. Um, we're meeting with community groups and organizations and working on a court-serving instrument in order so, for us to better understand the needs of our court users. And as was mentioned previously, we had the National Center for State Court Study that was also conducted and it has really um, influenced and helped guide us on this path of how do we truly um, meet the needs of our court users and consumers. Once we're able to kind of ascertain what those issues are, it's about assessing, assessing where we are right now at the court, what works well, what doesn't work, what we need to improve. Um, we have really great programs here at the judiciary, including um, our language access programs that are provided by the Office of Court Interpreters. Um, and I always have to give a shout out to my interpreters because they play such a critical and vital role in ensuring justice here at the judiciary. Each year, we handle thousands of cases and our interpreters, they work tirelessly to make sure that language access services are provided to Rhode Islanders free of charge. Um, in addition, we are working to collaborate with community partners to address the needs of self-represented litigants and of course the provision of accommodations to court users. Um, the, the other things that we're looking at is making sure that we're able to assess the systemic gaps and barriers that individuals have and that may have prevented or made accessing justice more difficult for marginalized groups um, and being able to respond to those. So again, that assessment piece. And then final, or the third prong is the implementation. So we're working on different projects with our um, courts within the unified state court systems. We've got projects with family court, superior court to develop self-help guides, um, making sure that those self-help guides are readable, making sure that information is, um, that people can understand and retain that information, which I think we can get into a little later. Um, and then also developing resource cards so people know how to contact our office so that they can receive the access to justice services. Um, on the language access front, we are working and have identified the need for more credentialed local interpreters. Um, and that really has to do with the fact that we just don't quite frankly have enough interpreters. We're seeing a lot of people leaving the state of Rhode Island um, because of uh, cost of living or um, other reasons. And so trying to increase the number of our interpreters. And so again, collaborating and working with community partners like CCRI in order to create 
create a workforce development project um, where CCRI is now offering a court interpreter program. Um, and then finally, one of the most one of the things that I'm really excited about here at the judiciary that we're working on is the revamping of our website, which is critical and crucial to making sure that we get out information to court users and that we can get that um, in a manner that's accessible and friendly. And then the step or the the final step is to repeat, right? So after we do all of these different things, after we listen to and um, look at what's going on in the courtrooms, we observe it, after we do the assessments, um, after we implement new plans, we then have to take a moment to step back and say, okay, where do we go from here? And then we repeat the project or the cycle again. So I'm really excited to be a part of the Access to Justice Office. And I am, um, I'm excited to be a part of the judiciary. Um, and I commend our chief as well as our state court administrator for even um, taking this on as a priority and a, a initiative for the judiciary. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Judge Smith, could you describe your sense of the justice gap in Rhode Island and how, as a jurist, you experience that gap? Could you describe the Committee on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Rhode Island courts and why it's relevant to this conversation? We can't, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Number one, I, before I thank you, I want to apologize uh, for all my technical um, deficiencies and issues. Uh, I did the test and I didn't know that I was getting assigned to this courtroom today, so I apologize, but I think we got everything working now. Um, but also number two, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here and be a part of this uh, presentation. I'm excited to be here. Um, I think in addressing your questions, I'll, if I can reverse them, uh, address them in reverse order. Um, so the Committee for Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts, uh, the main goal is a couple of different things. We are attempting to, and hopefully promoting and enhancing uh, public confidence, integrity, transparency, impartiality, and access to the courts. That is our main drive. And we're doing that through a lot of different avenues, um, specifically, um, self-examination throughout the judiciary, education throughout the judiciary and the public, uh, a lot of public outreach going into different communities and listening to other people's issues, other people's struggles and how the court plays a role in that. Um, we're looking at discrimination, we're looking at unconscious biasness, and we're looking at desperate impact. And we're in, in doing all of those things, we're trying to take affirmative steps to not only uh, self-monitor, but to combat these inequities and make a more just, transparent uh, system. And we are, what Tara was saying, uh, Tamara was saying, we are continually repeating that. So it's not a, a one solution fits all, it's something that is changing over time. So going into those justice gaps that you talked about with your initial question, um, they look different from my perspective. Um, I see them a lot more on the civil calendar than the criminal calendar. And one of the main ways I see that is you are not entitled to an attorney in Rhode Island on civil cases as you are on criminal matters. So typically I see that when we have pro se litigants. Um, certainly Tamara talked about language access. And I also wanna give a shout out to all of our amazing interpreters. Um, they work so hard and their hours are so long. I always say, do you have your roller skates on? Because they're always bouncing around from uh, courtroom and courthouse. Um, but that is a struggle that we are continually working on, um, making sure that everybody has that avenue and that access um, to the courthouse and that they have an opportunity to understand every single thing that's happening um, because their liberties and their properties are at stake. Um, but I think we do a tremendous job, like anything else, we can always do better, but we are making a lot of great advancements um, in that lane. The other thing we look at is, and the biggest thing for me that COVID has really brought to the forefront is technology. Um, we need to reinvest in technology. Uh, we see that we have things that can potentially shut down uh, our normal way of doing business and a lot of other courts, federal courts and other things have been able to do things a lot differently than we have specifically in district court 
because of our um, lack of ability um, with pro se litigants to always have the technological capabilities to handle uh, remote hearings and other things like that. So um, in all, the committee is addressing all of these things and it's the overall experience of anybody that enters the courthouse and it's the overall confidence um, that we can hopefully enhance in the public eye uh, and the transparency and all of those things are under the umbrella of uh, not only the access to justice, but addressing any of those uh, gaps that we see. Thank you. Um, Danielle, uh, could you just speak to what you're seeing nationally with the state court access to justice initiatives? Um, and what are the trends in terms of court improvements and innovations? Um, again, thank you for having me. I'm sorry, I'm like a bad penny. You got me again. Um, so for all of you listening, sorry. Um, uh, I would say two things. One, I um, I'm an optimist by nature, and I think the pandemic has been um, deeply difficult for many, many people and for lots of reasons. But as it relates to court innovation, it has been a pretty exciting time because courts, by necessity, had to think about how to do things differently and unlocked the ability to, to think about all sorts of systems differently. And I think the challenge for us now is to maintain that spirit of innovation and willingness to change. Um, but we've seen courts adapt calendaring practices to go remote, which have been really positive. Um, we've seen the ability to have hearings remotely so that you don't have to take off work necessarily for a whole day to attend your hearing, et cetera. Um, and then I would say generally not to make this problem more complicated, but Catherine and I are part of national work um, called, through a rubric called Justice for All and thinking about the legal needs, the unmet legal needs of, of all of our community members and that the numbers of people that come to court are a small fraction of the people who have unmet civil legal needs more generally um, and either take no action or are paralyzed because they don't know what to do or afraid of the system or all of the above. And so there is a real challenge and a wonderful opportunity for partnerships with organizations and um, nonprofits and community groups um, and universities to think about how we increase, we develop more information and share it widely so that people can use the law um, as a protection, not always just something that they experience negatively. Thank you. Um, Nellie, uh, can you describe why you got involved in the eviction help desk? Um, what your sense of the self-represented tenants experience is with the help desk and imagine what it was before the help desk. Great, yes. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm really happy to be here and to share my experience with the eviction help desk. I got involved. Uh, I was really excited when this project came about my 2L year. I worked in evictions before coming to law school, and it's the reason why I came to law school, is I wanted to be an advocate, um, not just to support the advocacy in the office that I was in, which was Help, Help USA Home Base. And so when the project started at the at Providence District Courthouse, it was very exciting because it had never happened before. There had never been anything like that in the um, for pro se tenants facing eviction. There, there was never a desk, there was never anybody offering free legal services right there for people walking in that didn't know what was going on. So I got involved because it was quite similar to the work I'd done before, but I really exciting because it was brand new here. And during COVID, which was touching everybody in so many different ways and everybody differently. So that's why I got involved. Um, the experience that I see for pro se tenants every day, I was actually there this morning. So it's the, it's the same thing every day. You see people come in and they don't even know what the forms that they've been handed mean. They don't know if this is an eviction notice or it means something else. They don't know if it's a rent demand or, and just having somebody not even entering for them, but somebody that can just tell them what this piece of paper means and what their rights are. And as many of the other panelists have said, if this person doesn't speak English, there's another obstacle in their way um, and getting them to a person that can understand them and be able to get them uh, 
the resources to know what it's happening, what it's happening, and sometimes even represent the person that day, be able to enter an appearance for that person and just really, um, even if it's just negotiating with their landlord, change that person's um, situation dramatically. I, before, to answer the question about before the help desk was there, I, I can't imagine because I've only ever known the district court with the help desk, but I see the confusion now and the way that we help people even just having a basic conversation. So I can't imagine how confusing it was before the desk was there because every time somebody comes in for an eviction, they're having the worst day of their life. And you have that stress and that anxiety topped with if you don't speak English and you don't understand what the form means and they're calling your name and maybe they haven't called your name yet. And just that trying to navigate the courthouse by yourself just seems impossible. So yes, that's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, and just for those who, who might not know, when we refer to the eviction help desk, we're referring to a program that started um, in the early, early fall of 2021. Uh, it's a collaboration between Rhode Island Legal Services, which is our LSC funded legal services organization, the Center for Justice uh, and the law school um, and the court to provide a help desk in the district court um, outside of the courtroom where evictions happen. Um, and the student's role is to do uh, screening and intakes with uh, pro se litigants. Uh, there's always a supervising attorney from one of the two legal services organizations there. Um, and so just to give you a sense of, of, of what that is. Um, I'd like to just um, start now with um, kind of a look at what happens before people get to the courthouse. Danielle, mentioned, you know, that a lot of people don't know that the issues that they're having, the problems that they're, they're having even lend themselves to legal remedies. Um, but many people with civil legal issues and or cases never make it to the courthouse. Why is that? Um, Judge Smith, do you, do you want to take that initially? Sure, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think that a lot of people are overwhelmed about the experience of coming into a courthouse and what is required of them. I think that people understand that there is a profession that is assigned with going to the courthouse and a profession that you go through extra schooling to know how to navigate things in the courthouse. And so I would assume that there is a fear associated with that. Everything that we do, especially on the civil calendar is very technical in nature. Things matter, uh, T's and I's uh, being dotted and crossed matter. And if those things aren't, sometimes a case can go south for one of the parties. So I think there is a reluctance uh, from the very beginning sometimes to even want to step foot in a courthouse to try to advocate for a position that you might have. Tamara, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think um, Judge Smith, he he's right on. I think that there is a hesitation um, from a lot of individuals to even enter the courthouse because of maybe past experiences um, that they've had in the judicial system or with the judiciary, whether it's been um, their own experiences or experiences that they've learned about. Um, you know, and I think that even when you're talking about the limited English proficient community, there's another stress level that's there. Um, so not only do you have to figure out how to navigate this legal system, but you have to figure out how to navigate this legal system in a language that you're not comfortable and familiar with. And so I think it poses a huge barrier for people. And quite frankly, um, some would rather forego getting help from the judiciary, getting help from the court um, and seeking a legal solution to their problem and instead figuring out how they can um, figure it out outside of court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Catherine, why might um, litigants fail to seek out legal assistance? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, we have some groundbreaking research that was done by Becky Sandifer, now a professor at Arizona State University, um, a MacArthur Fellow, um, many um, might be aware of her work, that really helped us capture the idea that a lot of people just don't know they have a legal problem, right? And, and as Judge Smith was saying, I mean, we're very aware of you know, it's a profession, right? We, we're the ones, you're, we're the interlocutors to the court, so to speak. But for um, not law trained people, they're just living their life and law is entwined in that, right? You're, you, you might have a divorce or a custody issue or a debt. It's just part of your life. And so they might initially see it as, I'm just having a, a family issue. Um, and the legal part sort of seems like a technicality um, later on. And I think because for them, the real issue is solving the family problem. And in areas like debt or landlord tenant, again, they think, oh, maybe this isn't so complex. And they're unaware of defenses that can be raised or obligations that are on creditors or landlords to behave in certain ways. I think also finding and hiring a lawyer can be a very opaque process for the public. Um, and, you know, we're, I know we're talking to law students, so here's, here's my pitch to you. Um, you are part of your community. Uh, be, be visible in your community. Um, be welcoming. Be inclusive. Participate in your community so people can find you. It is very intimidating to even try and find a lawyer. And so in the limited time people have, um, they'd rather work on solving their problems, the practical aspects of their problems, than trying to hunt down a lawyer that you think well, I probably won't even get. And to be frank, um, the, the profession often struggles with a, a reputation with the public um, of, of taking simple things and making them more complex or ratcheting up uh, conflict. And so this is another reason that as, as members of your community, you impact how you comport yourself, um, impacts how your community thinks of the legal profession. And we know our branch is in crisis right now. So we're all emissaries. Um, you know, we believe in the rule of law um, and we're all emissaries to try and hold that up. And finally, I'll just add the expense um, for full representation, as we know, is just uh, you know off the charts uh, for, for most working people and certainly for people that are um, living in poverty, completely inaccessible. And I think this is where unbundling comes in as a great business opportunity, not just for lawyers, but also a solution for the public. And it's really exciting to see you, you have a rule. I've reviewed that. And, and I think law students, um, I encourage you to be very interested in this as you build your the business practice um, side of your, your law uh, practices. So just because you mentioned unbundling, can you um, define that? Um, sure. So historically, uh, when you, you hired a lawyer uh, to just take over your problems, right? You know, here's $5,000, handle everything about my divorce. Um, for those, that, for students that are on the call who've been through your, your ethics classes, you, you know that there's sort of a divide of what the, the, the lawyer is in charge of, of strategy, and but you can't do, you have to have your client's consent to enter into, let's say, a, um, a, a, a negotiated settlement or something like that. In, the, in unbundling, what we do is we disaggregate the legal problem. We break it down into all the separate tasks and the public can hire um, a lawyer to do a discrete thing. So a lot of getting through court, and I know we've already heard a lot about it and we're going to hear more, you know, it's forms, right? It's filling out forms. Um, there's a lot of administrative work. How many copies do I make? Where do I mail this? All that administrative work um, with, with support, self-represented litigants can do very well, but, but they need legal advice, right? And so lawyers practicing at the top of their license, um, what are the ramifications of in a custody case if one party is moving out of state? You know, that's a clear cut legal issue. Are there defenses um, to this debt issue? And so unbundling lets somebody for a more affordable rate hire for that targeted help and the, the litigant themselves can handle the rest of the matter. Thank you. Tamara? Yeah, I just wanted to add, in Rhode Island, we, um, we, we use the term limited scope representation. So anyone who's interested in limited scope representation can always take a look at our um, rules of professional conduct. And um, in particular, rule 1.2 of the rules of professional conduct. And that gives you a lot of information on number one, how to um, how to make this a practice if that's something that you wanna do. But also there's a lot of information in the commentary to the 
rules um, to really explain what are your obligations when you're entering into an engagement for limited scope representation, what you need to include in that engagement letter to your client, um, as well as um, what you need to include if the, the terms of the limited scope representation change. Thank you. And I would just add that Catherine's organization has done yeoman's work nationally in promoting unbundled or limited represent limited scope representation. And so the SLRN is a fabulous resource that if you're interested, you should check out. Wonderful. Um, so returning to, um, you know, why litigants might not seek out legal assistance and, and the barriers that keep, um, keep them from doing that. Um, do you think that these barriers affect particular groups more than others? Catherine, Danielle, either of you? I'll kick off and then okay. Danielle will pick up. Um, you know, I think the absolute bit barrier, and I, I know Danielle can speak um, much more in depth on this and the work that so much of the work she's done in her career is language and, and disability, right? I mean, if there's just a bar to even understanding what's going on. Um, and certainly you know, the low moderate income folks who cannot take, as Danielle referenced earlier, a whole day off from work to go to a hearing or possibly lose their job because they had a 15 minute scheduling hearing. Um, but, uh, you know, so those are real barriers. But we have some really exciting research going on right now that, that is looking, trying to explore whether we can better understand how some populations are disproportionately impacted by certain types of legal matters. Um, and, you know, so low income, folks, housing stability, right? That's the easy one we can all anticipate. But um, some of this research that is just getting underway right now um, is, is looking at, for instance, um, the role of trauma in people's lives and as a predictor to the amount of legal problems that they might face. And once we kind of can, or, or um, members of the LGBTQ community um, being subject to um, certain uh, discriminations and exceptions or people in the BIPOC community. And once we kind of get the, that kind of granularity to understanding it, it's the opportunity for um, community engagement and partnerships within our community. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add there. Um, I, I The only thing that I would say as it relates to language access, which isn't always a necessary proxy, but I, you know, I think there was real damage done um, when immigration um, was coming into courthouses. And um, I think there is a real, not all immigrants necessarily have LEP needs or limited English proficient needs, but I think there is a lasting stigma that comes when there have been immigration enforcement sweeps in courthouses across the country. And so I would, the only thing I would add is a finer point about um, immigrant communities and using the courts. Yeah. Okay, um, let's turn to once litigants arrive at the courthouse, whether for a scheduled hearing or a trial, or because they're faced with a legal issue that they understand can be addressed by the court. Some of the challenges that underrepresented communities face when they arrive to court include, as we've discussed, language, disability, lack of information, lack of affordable legal help and representation, insufficient self-help materials, and lack of understanding of procedure and forms that are complicated or hard to decipher. I'm, I'm hoping that each of you can comment on these and any other challenges that I've failed to mention. Um, and then we can turn to solutions and approaches to these challenges. Um, Catherine, I'm sorry to keep calling on you, but <laughs> You have this national perspective that um, is. Yes, uh, thank you. And my, my name begins with A, so I've become accustomed to being called on first. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, mine, and mine begins with V, so I'm always last. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, and I'll just give a, a sort of an umbrella thought here for, for our audience and, and then let everyone else comment on the details. It really is the lack of transparency and the public not understanding what the expectations are of them once they get to court, right? And, and people want to make judges happy. Nobody, nobody has a desire to go into a courtroom and frustrate a judge. 
But if they don't know what they're supposed to do, that is that is exactly the situation they find themselves in. So, you know, I am somebody who just believes um, really strongly in the sort of be practical and educate people in the process. But focus on the lack of transparency. You, you just, they have no idea what's going on until we tell them. Judge Smith? I could jump, yes, I was, I was just going to, uh second that of uh, expectations, you know, specifically on the civil calendar, we try to put in the notices what is expected of everybody when they come to the courthouse, but um, in the midst of their lives and everything else they're involved in, they always don't read those notices uh, as carefully as you would like them to do. And so what I see is the biggest challenge when they come into court, specifically on the civil calendar, is they're not prepared to go to hearing the day that their matter is scheduled for trial or hearing. Um, the notices say it's for hearing, but that's a very specific word that has specific connotations to specific people and people who aren't um, versed in that language don't understand. And typically when they do come in, it's, oh, well, I have this, but not with me. And certainly we try to be accommodating in certain circumstances to give people the opportunity, but sometimes we can't always be depending on the uh, situation. And I do find that that is a huge issue or um, a lot of times we'll see uh, they have pictures on their phone, but they don't want to give their phone to the landlord's attorney. Understandably, I don't want to hand my phone to a stranger either, but um, those issues and they ultimately um, affect sometimes how a case uh, resolves. Others? Nelly, do you want to um, speak to sort of the the challenges that you see self-represented litigants facing when they come into the courthouse and then up to the third floor in Providence? Of course, uh, as I was, and a couple other people have mentioned, uh, just the forms, not understanding what these different pieces of paper mean. And I, I find the fact that people walk up and get to the third floor to the eviction help desk and they don't even know if they are in court, if they have an eviction going on, if they're being evicted and the forms all look different. Sometimes they say different landlords also have a way of, if it's not an eviction notice, wording it very, very strongly to scare someone to think that they have to be out at the end of the week or something. And you now having that conversation with somebody that this isn't even an eviction yet, they haven't even taken you to court. And the fact that people don't even understand if they're in court or not, just um, that that level of confusion. I, I'll oftentimes people don't even know to go to the third floor. They'll be lost in the courthouse. So I think that that just adds to the anxiety of, again, it's everybody's worst day of their life. They're getting evicted. They, they feel like they don't know where their kids are gonna go. They don't know where they're gonna, how they're gonna, today, how they're gonna find an apartment when landlords want, three or four months rent and you to make 70% of the, the, um, the, the, over the cost of the apartment, they want that you to make an astronomical amount of money beyond what people likely make. And just um, trying to have that conversation with somebody that they don't have to leave today or they don't have to leave at the end of the week. And I think it would be so helpful if the court could be just a little bit more clear about what's on each floor or um, just in terms of if there was resources we talked a little bit about a website if there was any kind of way there could be a website that explained what these different forms mean or um, how in walking people through an eviction process thank you um tamara can you talk a little bit about the ada and the the kinds of um uh, disabilities that you are seeing and trying to, um, you know, the ways in which you are working to make the Rhode Island courts more accessible? Yeah, definitely. So um, from an ADA point of view, 
Um, the majority of the requests that we receive at the judiciary are for um, the deaf and hard of hearing. And so um, in that we receive requests for American Sign Language interpreters, as well as certified um, American Sign Language and certified deaf interpreters. Um, and, as, and then we also receive requests for assisted listening devices, which is something that I think is coming up more regularly. Um, I'm not quite sure what the correlation is, why we're receiving um, more requests for that, but that is something that we are receiving. Um, what I've noticed, and one of the things that we've, we're working on at the judiciary is um, really trying to understand the needs of that community in particular, the deaf and hard of hearing community, because of the challenges that they face when they come into the courthouse. Um, we know that, again, it's a high risk venue for them because of what is at stake if miscommunication occurs um, and the consequences that miscommunication um, can result in. And so trying to understand um, what we can do at the judiciary to help them. One of the things that, um, and I actually just had a meeting with a, with a group, um, one of the things that is needed is, a, um, is additional interpreters in Rhode Island. And that's something that we are looking to continue to work and collaborate with different organizations so that we can try to figure out how we can get more interpreters in the courthouse um, to help provide communication for our court users um, that require these um, these services. Um, but the other issue that was raised is an understanding of the community and um, the community wanting for judges, attorneys, uh, social workers, and everyone who's involved in the justice system to really understand the challenges that they are going through and that they're facing so that people can have more patience when dealing and handling these matters. And so, again, another thing that we're working on is educational opportunities for um, both our judiciary employees as well as going and speaking and uh, collaborating with other organizations. Thank you. Um, so, Catherine, do you think that the access to justice work um, that we're all engaged in should be focused on helping self-represented litigants or on getting representation for people who aren't represented? Big question. Both, both, <laughs> um, absolutely both. Um, I think, you know, the, as, as Danielle was talking about earlier, the power of simplification and procedural simplification and the efficiencies that that brings about, not just for self-represented litigants, but also for the bar, right? Because then as they're navigating these cases, it becomes more simple as well. Um, but also for the bench, for the clerks, um, you know, one of, I think, you know, when Tamara was talking about the getting the accommodations for people who are hard of hearing, one of the reasons that's a real struggle in a courtroom, right, is it interrupts the flow and the time, you know, that the judge has set aside for the hearing and the staff and you've got to stop and you've got to change things. So these process simplifications, ed upstream education, so that when people come to the court, they're prepared, we don't try to sort of spring it on them. Ta-da, you're here. We want you to learn about what you have to do and tell us what you want to do all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that. So that I think all these self, uh, th these reforms in terms of making the court more accessible for all, right? Not it's not just self-represented litigants, right? It's everybody. Um, and then, but we we do need to increase um access to attorneys for those legal matters that that cannot, you know, are not just going to get resolved. Um, that there really are legal arguments and get the legal advice that they need to make those arguments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is the staggering number of self-represented litigants an issue of, in a, of income inequality in your view, or is it a problem with our legal system? Danielle or Catherine or anybody? I mean, I think it's so many things. Mm -hmm. um, Courts are only starting to really collect um, self-represented litigant data in a meaningful way over the past few years, but we don't connect that to a lot of other things. And so I think there are self-represented litigants um, who are doing it for DIY reasons. There are self-represented litigants who desperately want an attorney but can't find one. There are self-represented litigants who don't realize how long a court process is going to take. Um, and so they don't 
prioritize trying to find one at all, or you know, any number of other things, or they live in a small town and their ex-spouse has conflicted them out of any attorney they can figure out how to find. I mean, there are so many different reasons. I do think, you know, demographically, we have a disproportionate representation in the BIPOC community nationally and also low-income litigants, because a lot of times they're brought into the court system because of poverty. I mean, um, or the relationship between um, various systems. So there's a lot to untangle and we're often, the courts are often downstream of a lot of upstream policy choices that inform what happens in the court. But that said, like, I think there are many things that the Rhode Island courts have begun or have been putting in motion to try to address that and that nationally we have to reckon. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that to, to all of that, that law reform is also part of it. It's looking at the statutes and doing simplification isn't just procedural. It also needs to be substantive, update our statutes to reflect the society that we live in today, um, not, not one a hundred years ago. And so that, that, is, that is a whole nother area, um, but that can have a huge impact. And if I could just add to it, I, I think that these are these conversations are important, again, to collaborate so that we can figure out, you know, the different pieces of the puzzle, and then work together to really ensure that we have justice for all and that we're providing that continuum of service and that we're making sure that, you know, everyone is doing their part. If I can just add one last thing about self-represented litigant, litigants in, um, in eviction proceedings is that oftentimes when they're brought into court, they don't even consider the idea of getting a lawyer. That option is not even on the table because they, they, don't, even, they don't even factor that in as a possibility and they haven't, they're not aware. So oftentimes we'll see at the eviction help desk, they don't even know about Rhode Island Legal Services or the Center of Justice. That's the first time they're being given this information is they're in the court. And so the fact that they didn't even consider that they would need a lawyer only because they didn't think that would even be an option and the power imbalance, very rarely do you see a landlord that isn't represented. And just that that power imbalance is so obvious it's just something to be aware of how necessary the education is. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so e all of, of you have touched on um, some ways that we can make the courts more accessible, the courthouse more accessible um, to self-represented litigants, to people who um, have limited uh, English language, um, you know, the whole range of, of people who are faced with challenges. Um, but I, let's just dig in a little bit more and, and um, you know, t if you could share as many concrete um, solutions that you imagine or know about um, I think that would be really great. In the earlier panel, there was talk about, you know, kiosks and help desks like what we have in, in Rhode Island. But um, I know there are lots of models around the country and, um, and there's a full spectrum of really simple solutions to more complicated solutions. And, um, and we will in our next panel be talking about some of the technological solutions, but I would love to Kind of get from all of you um, as much as you can give us. <laughs> all right, I've got one. Um, community integrations in courtrooms. We've seen this a lot with eviction diversion across the country, but um, embedding uh, credit counselors, financial counseling, social workers, public benefit screens in courthouses so that um, court judges can refer people to those services either in the middle of a case or at the end of it. And if I had a magic wand, I'd have another team of social workers that could follow after the case to see both on the landlord and the tenant side if they needed access to additional services. Um, so that would be my magic wand wish. Oh, I love that. I would, definitely highlight, I would definitely highlight the social worker aspect because a lot of times when people come into the courthouse for a specific court case, 
while you're dealing with one thing, you know that there are other issues um, that are arising that are being contributing factors to them being there. And while you can't always address them within the case that is in front of you, it's very important for the holistic approach. One of the things that I really like about being with the public defender's office is you could address things on a holistic approach. And if we knew that there were issues outside of the criminal case, we could try to address those things, housing, mental health, substance abuse. But from the bench, I don't really have that avenue or that context for the cases that are coming in front of me because all the conversations are taking place out in the hallway and it's only coming in in front of me to enter into that stipulation or to start that hearing. So I think the idea of having so dedicated social workers, especially around the civil calendar, would be a huge um, improvement in magic wand that I think we could offer. Um, the other thing that I think has been one of the most successful things that I've seen in terms of access has been the uh, help desk. I think that it has 100% uh, changed the way that we have done things on the civil calendar um, in district court. Prior to COVID, when we had 120 cases a day, um, you know, it was really easy for people to fall through the cracks of the system. And having that help desk there really does a couple different unbelievable things. And Catherine has I said, stated it, but, you know, it gets people representation, but it also gets, um, gives people advice. Uh, it gives people a sounding board because a lot of times once they come in front of me, they want to talk about stuff that's not relevant. And it's hard to get them to focus on what's relevant for what's actually in front of me. So just having that help desk, while well, certainly the representation is great, having that sounding board and that advice of, hey, you're going in there by yourself, but this is what is affected us. Do you have pictures? Let's go see if we can go up to the sixth floor and check them out, or something along those lines is huge. And so if I have a magic one, and I know the law school um, and the court has done so much on this, I want to see that. Like that in every courthouse, um, you know, from nine to four. I know certainly it's a staffing issue. We don't have as many people as we'd like to be involved with it um, for a lot of host of issues, but um, having people available in the afternoon and in other courthouses, and um, I think that, that would be my magic wand. Thank you, love that. Anybody else? Tamara? Yeah, I'll go next. Um, so if I, I guess my magic wand moment would be um, community outreach and being able to hit all of the different communities outside of the courthouse, because I think when you go and you meet people where they are, right, it lowers that stress level a bit and you're able to get more information to them um, that they may not need today, right, but hopefully if a situation comes up in the future, they have the information or they may say, hey, I remember there was a girl who came in and she was talking about something about access. Let me see if I can find that card somewhere. Um, and, you know, uh, Judge Smith and his committee, they did a amazing um amazing focus group that I think led to a lot of change in the costs and fines. And so I think if we could do more of that, and that's something that our office is committed to, is just trying to really engage with people outside of the courthouse so that we can really educate them about their rights, educate them about the, the system itself, and then about what services are available. Because it's not helpful to have a ton of services or a ton of forms or a ton of um, programs if people don't know about the services, the forms, the programs. And so we really have to make a um, be intentional about how we're getting in contact with people and getting this information out. Yeah, so true. Uh, Judge Smith, can you just um, talk briefly about the fines and fees work of the committee and um, and how that was connected to the community? Absolutely. So the committee just started in 2020, but I feel like we've been doing a bunch of things that have been around for a lot longer. Um, and we have uh, different sectors of people that are concentrating on different areas of improvement. Uh, and one of the things that came about were uh, the cost and fines and the burden um, that it carries with people who have gone through the criminal justice system and how it lingers and it really uh, inhibits their ability to move on from it long after their probation or their incarceration is over. Um, and so in doing one of these public outreaches and going into the community and hearing about people's real world experiences, we kept hearing 
this underlying theme of I haven't been on probation for five years, but I'm still paying costs and fines, and I still have, and if I don't go, I'm worried that uh, a bench warrant could issue for uh, failing to appear to make a payment, even though we don't issue warrants for not paying, it's for not being somewhere where you're supposed to be, but just that additional burden that was already over them. And uh, we do have certain statutes on the books that cause us to look at a person's financial situation um, prior to imposing uh, costs and fines or as soon as readily available thereafter. And so we were able to, uh, working with the chiefs and the administrations at each court, set up a program and different events where people could come into the community and um, we could take every case on an individual basis to start uh, releasing some of that uh, pressure um, from some of these people who have tried to move on and better their lives. And so it's been a really successful program uh, in Superior Court, they're doing it on more of a routine basis. They have a little bit more resources and the way that they do cost and fines is a little different than we do in District Court. The District Court has started doing it as well. Um, and I don't have the exact numbers, but it's upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been remitted uh, to release that tension on uh, individuals in society. Yeah, I mean, it's been a tremendously powerful uh, initiative and, and the the collateral consequences in the civil area are, you know, um, extensive. So in the work that I've been doing, I've seen those fees and fines really um, keep people back in other areas that are civil, you know, kind of housing and licensure. And um, so that's just been such a great, great program. Um, I would also mention that there's a wonderful um, webinar that is on the National Center for State Courts website um, that highlights the work that our judiciary did um, with the cost and fines. And so I don't know if Danielle has that or not, but I'm sure that we can get that and put that um, and get that out to the attendees if they want to take a look at it. Um, our Judge Dubos, she was very instrumental in it, as well as Judge Matos, and they give a great overview in that webinar of what led to um, led to those actions following. So we're we are closing in on um, on time here, but I I want to be sure to address this issue of access to justice commissions. Um, Rhode Island is one of fewer than 10 states uh, in the country without an access to justice commission. And I was hoping um, that um, our panelists and perhaps Catherine could talk about um, how developing an access to justice commission in Rhode Island could be beneficial um, with respect to these issues that we've been um, touching on today. And Danielle, you may have thoughts on that as well. Um, thank you. I'm actually going to just defer to Danielle, who okay. staffed uh, Access to Justice Commission. Um, the only note I would say bef before she talks about how important and, and really what they can do and what it would do for Rhode Island is I don't think it is um, a condition precedent in order to do access to justice reform. Um, the work when I was first hired by the Alaska court system in 2001, there was not a commission um, that, that was doing this work. And it was the momentum of just the court doing that opening, you know, the doors up and really being more accessible to the community. It changed the name of the clerk's office to customer service. And that simple name change actually began to shift the mindset of everybody in the system and built self-help services. That creates the momentum that can help really launch and then combined with the, the Fairness and Access Committee that, that you have, and that's what all we had in Alaska back then, um, but that can really help the momentum to get a commission. But I'm gonna defer to Danielle because she was the master of building one. No, I uh, I agree 110% with Catherine's, you know, like so at a certain point it's semantics, but there is whatever it's called, uh, the, the bringing together of the bar, the courts, the legal funders, the practitioners uh, together in some kind of uh, forum to communicate and collaborate effectively. And I would also add community partners too are really vitally important 
has is a key to success. I think for, I was, as Catherine mentioned, part of the Illinois Access to Justice Commission. And I think, um, at least while I was there, our biggest contribution was really deciding what everyone's lanes were and how kind of to a racy matrix, like who was responsible for what things and to make sure everyone knew what everyone else was doing, but that everyone wasn't focused on the exact same thing. So mm -hmm. for example, the commission in Illinois was connected to the Illinois Supreme Court. So the commission's focus was going to be on rules, processes, and things that happened in court. How can we support what happens in the court? Um, whereas the bar was really working to get increased advocacy at the state and federal level for um, improved legal reform, funding for legal aid, and pro bono. Um, and that was different from, for example, the IOLTA Foundation, which was actually giving grants to legal aid. So understanding everyone's role within the ecosystem and having a place to decide what is the step we all have to come together to decide and what is the step we just need to share with one another is really valuable. And so whether that's called the commission or that's a committee, um, I wouldn't let semantics get in the way of substance. That's very helpful. Thank you. So I think we've run out of time. Um, I want to thank each of you, Tamara, Catherine, Judge Smith, Danielle, and Nellie for spending this time and um, your willingness to participate in the panel, but also for all of the critically important work that you're doing in this area. Um, it's, it's, I just am in awe of all of you and what you do. Um, I also want to thank uh, Whitney and Katrina for putting this symposium together, uh, for putting together this group of panelists, um, and Chelsea for being behind the scenes and, and making everything work. Um, so uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to Katrina. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you again for speaking with us today. Um, I did see that we had one question in the chat. Um, so I was um, going to ask that. I do see that it has been answered by Danielle actually in the chat. Um, the question was, do you guys collaborate with law libraries on accessibility issues? Um, I, to be fair, I didn't answer that at all. I was just putting, it was the only place I knew how to communicate um, about the webinar that Tamara referenced. So I apologize to the person who put in that question. Um, and I would defer to Judge Smith and to Tamara to, to talk about law library partnerships in Rhode Island um, better than me. So sorry, Katrina, I just didn't want you to think I had answered it. I, really... I, I can take a stab at that one. Um, so our law library, uh, the director is Colleen Hanna. We work closely with Colleen to make sure that there's accessibility in our libraries. Um, I, and I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the question. Are we asking about collaboration with different law li or with different libraries in general? to provide information to court users, or are we talking about um, ensuring um, accessibility for those who are protected under the ADA? Um, Do we have clarification? The question doesn't necessarily specify, but I'd love to hear your answer on either. Perfect. So as far as um, collaborating with different libraries just to provide information to court users, I think it's an amazing way um, to, again, go out into the community and educate our community members about what, prob or what um, program services are provided by the court and the judiciary. We currently do not have any collaborations yet. However, we are always looking for more collaborative opportunities opportunities. So if someone does want to invite us, I'm always happy to attend um, and to provide additional um, information to different groups. Um, again, as it relates to accessibility um, within our uh, law library over at the judiciary, we work with Colleen Hanna to ensure accessibility. Thank you. Um, if anybody else has a question, please put it in the chat. Um, I did have a quick one, um, maybe for Nellie. Um, Nellie, do you have any other ideas besides the help desk that might benefit those who aren't represented in eviction cases? Who are represented in eviction no, who cases? Aren't. Who Sorry. aren't? 
Um, I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat it? ideas besides the help desk or? Yeah. Like, is there any other resources that you could think of that would be helpful? Definitely. Just it's not the eviction proceedings aren't the only confusion self-represented litigants have in court. That's just one that stands out to me because I spend a lot of time there. But I I think in any court proceeding, uh, whether it's family court, there's a million different reasons somebody could be in a family court proceeding. If there was a similar desk there, um, different, same with goes with criminal court, just, just access to information. It's really just about educating the community, putting the resources out there so people can educate themselves on how court proceedings look like. I mean, I always come back to evictions, but it, um, they don't, you don't have to be in an eviction proceeding necessarily to need to know what your rights are in your housing. Tenants have rights and landlords all the time take advantage of that. You see self-help evictions all the time, which are illegal and letting somebody know when they can bring a suit against their landlord is also important. Thank you. Um, Tamara, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted, I, I think this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the programs um, that we are working on here at the judiciary. So um, I have the wonderful opportunity of working with some of our lower courts, including family court and superior court, about um, how to get this information to court users, how to navigate the judicial system, how to navigate different processes, how to navigate um, even court orders, administrative orders and protocols. And one of the things that we're working on is, um, again, meeting people using that multimedia approach by developing videos, in particular for family court, um, explaining how to navigate through the divorce process from start to finish. Um, also, process of service um, or service of process, which I'm not sure if Danielle is still here, but it's something that Zach was able to help us with. And, um, and we had a, you know, a call when we first started, just trying to figure out how we get this information over to court users. Um, and then again, utilizing checklists um, so that when individuals come to the court and let's say they're looking to file a divorce, that they know exactly all of the things that they need to include and bring back with them when they get their packet of information. Um, and then using those prescription pads that I think uh, Danielle and Zach spoke about earlier today. Um, so we're in the process of developing all of these things and these packages for our court users. And then again, utilizing our website as well to make sure that this information is given to them both on the web, but then also in hard copy form, because we know that not everyone has access to, um, to the internet. If I could just, I just want to highlight one thing that uh, Nelly said that when we talk about it, uh, Tamara said it earlier about community outreach and getting into the community. One of the best examples that we saw, at least in um, the eviction calendar, was the success of the rent relief program and the millions of dollars that were able to go out to aid people to keep uh, their residencies or finding new homes. But one of the things that I was most amazed about that program to find out was I assumed that the majority of the money that was getting released from that program were to cases where evictions had been filed or um, evictions or uh, judgments have been entered. But upon speaking with people from the rent relief program, over two thirds of the money that was provided from that program, there was never an eviction filed. And so that tells me that they were able to get that word out and that program out to people in the community prior to an eviction being initiated, which is huge in and of itself. And so when we talk about a lot of things and uh, gaps and access, we're talking about once you get into the court system, but I think Tamara made a very important point when we talk about bringing these services to the community ahead of time in the hopes that for particular like rent relief that they don't even get to the courthouse. Um, you know, we're the kind of the last bar in uh, uh, a sense of all the hurdles that people have to go through, but getting into the community is huge. And I was just flabbergasted to hear that that much money had been dedicated to uh, non filed cases. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys again um, so much for your conversation today. I thought it was really interesting. Um, we're now going to take a short 10 minute break. Um, our next panel will start at 3.30 and focus on the role technology plays in shaping accessibility issues. 
So thank you again to our panelists and to our lovely moderator. Um, and we will see you guys soon. All right, everybody. So for our last session of the day, we are going to be discussing technology and the current programs, initiatives, and different projects that are currently in place to help solve some of the barriers that we've been talking about all day. As always, um, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A and we will address them at the end of the session. All right, I'll take it from here. Thank you, Whitney. Um, so I am Nicole. I'm the Director of Special Programs uh, Academic Affairs at Roger Williams. It is the end of a long day. I'm hoping that we can have a lighthearted, fun conversation about technology. If any of you have any access to justice tech access to justice technology jokes, I'd be open to them. Zach, if you want to put on like a sea captain costume, I'd be okay with that. You know, however we want to end this day, uh, let's do this. Um, today's panel is focused not just on A to J technology, but rather technology as a bridge or solution to a lot of the A to J problems we heard about today. I think a focus on solutions is a perfect way to end the day. Um, and I'm going to start with Lois. Um, to start us off and ground the conversation in a historical perspective, my first question is for Lois, who is the director of the Law and Innovation Lab at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law and the Maine Law Foundation Professor of Law Emerita at the University of Maine School of Law. In 2019, she received a Fulbright Senior Scholar Award where she researched A to J and technology at the University of Melbourne. Lois is an affiliated faculty member of the Harvard Law School Access to Justice Lab, co-principal investigator of the Financial Distress Research Study, and co-principal investigator of the Princeton Debt Lab. She's currently a visiting scholar at the Colorado Law and Policy Center. Lois, in a paper you co-authored, you stated that, quote, recent years have seen an expanding array of both technology and non-technology based tools designed with the purpose of helping people who cannot afford market rate lawyers. Such innovations have recently led to adjustments in funding for legal aid programs and an advancements in self-help and assisted self-help tools. These advancements include online client intake systems, self-help triage programs, legal diagnostic tools, robot lawyer chat systems, and legal expert system applications. These tools have the potential to be scaled to serve millions more people and make possible a system that provides effective legal help to everyone who needs it, when they need it, and in a form they can use, end quote. Um, you could start with a robot joke, or you could talk a little more about this change and the history of the relationship between access to justice and technology. Um, thanks, Nicole. Uh, I'm gonna pass on the robot joke, um, but I will make the observation that we now have in our pockets and purses a machine that is 32,000 times more powerful than the computer that sent the uh, Apollo um, rocket to the moon. And um, a recent study revealed um, that annually there are 55 million people who have experienced 260 million legal problems. Legal services funding has been flat or increased slightly, but not nearly enough. Um, currently, 92% of civil legal problems of low-income individuals um, did not receive any professional assistance. So out of this rising catastrophe has been born the idea that technology can scale scarce resources and enable serving more people. So the past 15 years, um, which is about as long as I've been involved, in these kind of projects, um, it, it's seen exponential growth of self-help tools that are designed to guide parties uh, through disputes um, and others needing help through the labyrinth that's our legal system. Thanks for uh, framing this for us. I mean, I think it really, what you said really speaks to me as the now is the time. And so the conversation we're having is not some theoretical thing. It's a very now thing. Um, the, my next question is for Zach. It's a follow-up question from our earlier panel, which I hope set the stage for the work that you've done for anyone who may have missed the earlier panel. Um, Zach is the principal court management consultant with NCSC and works on national level initiatives to increase access to justice, including working with various court systems to improve the experience of self-represented litigants through process improvement, technological innovation, and system change. At NCSE, 
Zach is a co-creator and co-host of Tiny Chats, offering free, digestible, and creative short-form educational videos on topics about A to J. He was also one of the principal court management consultants on a 2021 report prepared under a State Justice Institute grant award to the Rhode Island Administrative Office of State Courts, which assessed current efforts to provide court users with meaningful, equal access to the judicial process in the state of Rhode Island. Um, Zach, to expand and improve upon current access to justice efforts and SRL services, um, self-represented litigant services or SRL services, your report contained a range of recommendations. One of the recommendations is greatly increase the number of self-help resources available by utilizing a multimedia approach and create a prescription pad and or SRL information packet. Um, can you talk a bit about technological solutions you have seen work from other jurisdictions? Sure, uh, I'm sorry I don't have any uh, costumes totally ready and handy. I do have an eight ball, a magic eight ball, and I have uh, just a couple fake gold bars. That's as good as I can do on a Friday afternoon uh, within reach. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you might start by answering why you have <laughs> fake gold bars and then you can continue. I don't, what do you mean? Why wouldn't I? Uh, these are, <laughs> we got a funding tiny chat coming up. We're going to talk about how courts can access several funding streams. And so naturally we had to get some gold bars ready for that. And then the eight ball, I don't know exactly what we're going to do with that yet, but I have a feeling we'll be asking it questions and then we'll be giving you some answers. So stay tuned for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the technological landscape, uh, you know, there's a, there's a varying degrees of sophistication across the courts that we've worked with. And, and I think that um, what I'm encouraged by is that that sophistication stratification exists. You know, these things, some of them are hard to build. Some of them are not as hard to build. Um, but the fact that courts are trying to build these things is a good thing. You know, uh, a really true chat bot that uses artificial intelligence of some kind, that's pretty hard. Um, but including legal information in different ways for users, it actually isn't that hard. So, you know, some of that is a video, which is one way people learn. So maybe that's taking some PowerPoint slides and animating it lightly. And then you, uh, you being a court staff person could make that with very little cost. Maybe you use a vendor to do that. Same thing for a better higher production value, but those are more expensive to change. So you can see like just conveying information can happen in a number of ways. Um, I'll give you an example of a medium tech one that we did in another jurisdiction. It's called Traffic Paths, and you can see this on the Wyandotte County, Kansas uh, District Court's website. The problem was that there are two courts in Wyandotte County, Kansas that are literally across the street from each other. And depending on which one of the six to eight, I forget, uh, agencies that can write you a traffic ticket, you would have to go to one court or the other. It's dependent on who wrote you the ticket. And so as you can imagine in court over here, there's a big window for the clerk and there's a sign on that window that says, if you got one of these traffic tickets, you're in the wrong place or across the street. And across the street at the other court is the same sign saying, if you got one of those traffic tickets, you're in the wrong place or across the street. People don't know the difference between the district court and the municipal court. People don't understand why this traffic ticket leads to that. None of that really matters ultimately to people. What they know is they got a ticket and they're trying to deal with it in some way. So the traffic path we built using a platform called After Pattern. No code, it's really kind of a guided interview as an online thing. We did it with the court. And what it says, first of all, is who gave you the ticket? Which is like a very baseline kind of question, um, but it shows a picture of the ticket and shows you where to look to see who that agency is. So we've immediately removed some of that guesswork from that, that question. So people look, they look at the screen, they look at what they got in their hand, they say, okay, I got one of these tickets. And then you tell us that. And we immediately remove from your universe of choices all the things related to the tickets you don't have. So right there, you've already said to people, okay, we know something about you. We know these things don't apply. And then the next question is now that we know a little bit about you, what are your goals? What do you want to do? And if what they say is, I want to just pay this thing online, then we tell them how to pay it online. They pay it online, they're off, and they're that's it. They don't really care about the process for contesting it. They don't really care about how to pay for it in installments. If they said one of those other things, then that's what we tell them. And what's I think nice about this is it's not particularly complicated. The problem itself isn't particularly complicated. The navigation of the system is kind of complicated, but more than that, it's reorienting this stuff towards a user perspective to say, who are you and how can we help you? What do you want to do? And for the court staff, that's a wonderful thing because now people aren't showing up at the wrong window getting annoyed, perhaps justifiably frustrated. Why am I here? And the clerk said, why are you here? And then everybody's kind of in a bad mood. 
that goes away. Um, but then it also takes people to a point of like, we care about what your goals are and we're gonna give you just what you need to know to do what you say you want to do. And I think that reorienting the legal information conveyance, in this case, using technology to be that just in time and just what is needed legal information is really, really powerful because it puts people in a position to own a, to have some agency over that process and to give themselves an opportunity to like achieve those goals. And the court in a sort of way saying, and we support you in that effort that reorients the whole thing into like more of a, a user experience. And, and the technology, again, it's no code. So you don't need to know how to do computer programming like Quentin does. You could be a bozo like me who just thinks about this stuff a little bit and you can put it together in a way that allows people to think through what their options are. And then you remove options that aren't relevant, which is the other key part to that. Uh, a 75 page PDF that has every possible scenario in it in some ways is useful, but in other ways is overwhelming. So for people who are just trying to solve legal problems, and you can get some more complicated issues like divorce. If you don't have children, you really don't need to know about all that stuff that comes with parenting plan and custody and visitation and all that other stuff, remove it from the equation. So that, that's sort of how we think about a lot of the legal information pieces we do using tech. Um, I don't wanna to talk too much, so I'll stop there, but I'm happy to talk more about what we've seen around the country. Sure, thanks. Um, my next question is for Quentin, Quentin who knows code. Um, he's a practitioner in residence and adjunct professor at Suffolk University Law School's Legal Innovation and Technology Lab. His work focuses on closing the access to justice gap with technology, especially interactive tools that help people who cannot afford an attorney. Quinn's signature projects include MADE, the Massachusetts Defense for Eviction Tool, and Court Forms Online, an international response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2021, Quentin was named a legal rebel by the ABA Journal, an honor that we all should aspire to. The Suffolk Legal Innovation and Technology, or Lit Lab, is an experiential program which allows students to work as part of a consultancy and research and development shop focused on legal tech and data science work. Active areas of research involve, but are not limited to, the construction of expert systems, guided interviews, for example, chatbots, and algorithmic codification of tacit knowledge, for example, training computers to replicate human decisions. Lab students develop legal technology and data science solutions for organizational clients, for example, legal aid organizations, courts, firms, and nonprofits, helping them improve efficiency and effectiveness. These services are provided to organizational clients who frequently do not have in-house expertise in automating tools, engaging in process improvement and data analytics. Can you please talk a bit about your work in the A to J space at the Lit Lab and how you see technology as a potential solution to our A to J problems. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And actually, I had some slides that I think Whitney was going to drive, but looks like I have a share screen button. Maybe I can just share it myself. That's okay. My cat's going to make a little cameo here too, in lieu of a joke. Um, not acceptable. I'd love a joke. Um, Whitney, are you able to share the slides? I uh, if it's okay, I, I can and just advance if Perfect. that's okay. All right. Okay. Perfect, that's what I'll do then. Okay, and I'll try not to drone on with the slides too much here. There's a couple of fun ones in there if you wait. All right, so thank you, Nicole, for that introduction. And what I do and have been doing for the last five years is really trying to take the law, you know, this big amorphous blob and try to turn it into interactive questionnaires that are really easy for pro se people to use. So the MADE tool that Nicole mentioned, that was a tool I built at Greater Boston Legal Services when I was there as a housing attorney to help people get from, hey, I just got this notice to, I can actually file an answer in court and I'll get reminders to go to court and also be able to um, fill in all of the follow-up paperwork and all the motions that I would need to represent myself in an eviction case. And when I joined Suffolk, we took that same work that I did at GBLS and we made it apply to all of the things in Massachusetts uh, as much as we could, at least the, the most important and emergency things, because what happened was the same week that I started at Suffolk was the week that the university shut down, the world shut down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And suddenly we had all of these things that people were trying to get access to in the world, in Massachusetts particularly, through the court that they couldn't anymore because there was no online digital process to do it. So we're like, what can we do to make that accessible to everybody and as short of a time as we can? How can we start building these interactive questionnaires to help people get that access? 
and not take uh, months and months and months to deliver the tools. Um, so that's the problem that we've been focusing on for the last few years. I, we were successful with that by a massive outpouring of volunteer energy from around the world. And the way that we're continuing that work and improving it is to really zoom out. Um, so we're thinking big about better court forms and better court processes. We're trying to, to use data. Uh, we actually collected 18,000 court forms from 25 different states that were available online. And we're trying to get insights out of those to, to make them better and easier for people to use, both in terms of making them better court forms, more accessible, using better language for different people with different reading abilities, and to ultimately turn them into some of those interactive tools in as much of an automated, help, hands-on way as we can. So here's an example of one of the things that we've been working on recently, which is zoomed out to the big picture. Um, so what you can see here is our first draft of this instrument we've been building to tease out what are the important features of a court form that will affect how easy or hard it is for someone to fill it in. So we're looking at things like the reading grade level, the number of fields, the density of fields on the page, the number of words, the density of the words, how many challenging words, words that are outside of that kind of sh shared vocabulary of the most common 5,000, 6,000 words. And then also things like passive use of passive voice, use of legal citations that are kind of scrolled off the page. And then ultimately we want to get it to something like this, which on the right, that's kind of a mock-up of a score that you can get right now for something like a web page speed loading. Um, but we'd like to get to something like that, a score for a form that tells you this form really needs more attention and more work to be easy for a pro se litigant to use. And then moving back outwards to like, how do we scale up that insight to actually make a tool that's easy for someone to get access to what they need from the court? We've been thinking about just the, the very basics of digital access. How can we turn that into an automated tool that people can use? Um, and then I'll, I'll touch on a couple of the features, since we're talking about accessibility, that are really important to people who have different abilities. So here's the joke. It's an older one, but it checks out. Uh, if anyone knows this, this uh, exhibit uh, has a show called Pimp My Ride, and his catchphrase is, yo, dog. All right, I got one thumbs up. It goes over the head of my students now. A little bit too old, maybe, even as a meme format. So what we did is we took the process of creating one of these interviews, which we call document automation, is kind of a catch-all term for it, and we actually automated that itself as much as we could. So what that means is if you take a form that it, um, comes from a court website, you can actually click one button, this I'm feeling lucky button, and it will turn it into a draft automation for you, something that involves a lot of grunt work, a lot of boilerplate code. You no longer have to do all of that work by hand. How long will it take to get from that draft to a real usable form depends on you know, how much information, how much logic you need to add to it, because we can't put in kind of those branching pathways for the automator, but we can avoid them having to redo the things that are just like, would otherwise be copying and pasting or looking at a reference and then re replicating it again. We can do all of those by hand here, automated way. Hold on a second, I'm just gonna ask. Okay, oh, let me just, uh, so that's pulling up a link of what our index of 18,000 forms looks like, but actually I'm gonna go back to the slideshow here. Let's see. All right. Um, okay, it's not letting me do that, probably because I just have to use my mouse here, scroll, okay. All right, so this is what it looks like if you do go through it. Instead of clicking that I'm feeling lucky button step by step, you see you have a lot of options here to get through the building process and it's still in a guided way. The building itself is guided. And here's a preview of some of those accessibility features that I mentioned. So one thing that all of the tools that we build have is a really basic feature, this ability to read the screen aloud. 
That's something that people who have limited vision often have built into their systems and they know how to use and are really familiar with it. But what we found is that there are there's this group of folks who just aren't great at reading a lot of text on screen. They're not blind, but they may have difficulty just reading large amounts of text. So that read aloud feature is really helpful for them. Another important feature of what we've been building is language access is really at the top of mind for us. So here's a form that's been translated into English and Spanish. Um, I think the, the most languages any of our tools are translated in is up to five different languages. And we're just providing that as a way to try to make the law more accessible. One of the projects that I'm working right now, which is kind of cool, is we're, we're taking the whole housing sanitary code in Massachusetts, and we're trying to let people interact with it in ways that are um, more robust for them to protect their own rights. And that is going to be translated itself. So we're going to have the first translated version of the sanitary code that exists in at least four different languages. And just uh, by the end of this year, hopefully. The next thing that we're doing to really hold ourselves accountable to make sure our tools really are accessible to people with all different kinds of needs is we've built some features in to audit them for accessibility. So here you can see kind of a report that's built into the web browser for a single page of one interview, but we're trying to scale that up. So we built an automated tool that can run through all of the screens of an interview and, and make sure that they're all individually accessible, at least using the automated standards. And we're actually also um, now moving on to doing accessibility tests with real users to um, people who have different needs, like being uh, from the deaf and hard, and hard of hearing community, people who have vision uh, limits, limitations, and people with all different kinds of cognitive abilities. So we're in incorporating those folks into our usability tests to help make sure that our tools themselves are accountable. And here are a couple of links if you want to learn a little bit more about what we're doing. But um, Nicole, I'll stop talking and happy to hear any questions from you that that prompted. There are no questions. There's just a lot of praise for, for <laughs> the uh, pit my ride slide. I, I didn't ask for it and yet I got it anyway and I couldn't be happier. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is for Lois. As I previously mentioned, uh, you do all the things. Um, you're currently an affiliated faculty member at, Har at the Harvard Law School Access to Justice Lab, co-principal investigator of the Financial Distress Research Study, co-principal investigator of the Princeton University Debt Collection Lab, and was the principal investigator for the Apps for Justice project. Um, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about the work you have done and are doing in your various roles and how you see technology as a potential solution to our access to justice problems? And Whitney, if you can please share the slides. If I can share them the way Quinton did, that way I have control. So sure. I, I love control. <laughs> All right, hold on. And that was a law professor right. joke. Um, okay, next slide. So we recognize that um, self-help materials are the dominant form of, re of legal assistance received by low-income individuals and even low to moderate income individuals. So next slide. And we also recognize that there is a vast difference between um, access to materials and deployment of materials. And next slide, when, and, and next slide, um, next slide, this is what I was trying to avoid. Um, so in our research, which began back in 2012, we looked at thousands of pages of self-help materials and concluded that these self-help materials used in accessible jargon were very text heavy. They lack visual imagery. They lack organizers. They fail to provide uh, guidance about processes, such as how to conduct a negotiation. They fail to set forth what to expect in court. And most importantly, they help, they fail to help people overcome the emotional um, feelings they were having, shame, guilt, stress. And so we concluded 
that the state of the art in legal self-help must change. And we don't want to just change it. We need rigorous evidence of what sorts of materials produce good results. So we um, embarked upon the gold standard for studies, the RCT, randomized control trials. And this is the kind of trial that um, medical devices and pharmaceuticals are tested. And so it's a little more complex than I'm gonna describe here, but basically we randomized our group to 50% um, of them to our reimagined self-help materials and 50% were um, represented uh, by uh, Connecticut Legal Services. And um, our objective was to, next slide, produce rigorous evidence regarding where and when to deploy scarce lawyer time most effectively while designing new interventions that are less expensive than full human legal representation. So we also thought that there's a lot of great work going on in other fields that we can draw from. And so what we have done is um, reviewed literature on, and studies in distance education, public health, behavioral economics, experimental psychology, cognitive psychology, sociology, to just name a few, and came up with the following hypothesis. Individuals in financial distress will have trouble deploying professional legal knowledge as a result of a variety of barriers, cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and psychological challenges, debilitating feelings of shame, guilt, or hopelessness, a lack of self-agency, and failures in plan making and plan implementation. And so we looked at these barriers and came up with a variety of ways, again, drawing on interdisciplinary research to break these barriers down. So you know, first barrier, first example, when people are over indebted, they face the barrier of shame and guilt. And so the, the psychological liter literature um, tells us that self-affirmations actually help people when they are trying to do something that um, involves some degree of shame and guilt to um, affirm the fact that they really are good people just because they're in a bad situation. Um, next slide. Another barrier is people who have a lack of agency, um, who are not uh, often in a position to assert themselves, especially where when they are in an unfamiliar and inti intimidating context. So we have various exercises in our self-help materials where our protagonist, and we call this little guy Blob, is asserting him or her or itself um, in front of a mirror and modeling uh, what they can do in terms of their behaviors in court. Um, Next slide. There's also a lack of information and comfort with unfamiliar sound surroundings. So we included a lot of previews of what they can expect. So this is an example of Blob going to the courthouse. Next slide um, illustrates the information they need to bring to court. Um, next slide illustrates what they should expect to see when they enter court. The next slide is uh, what it looks like outside of the small claims courthouse. And the next slide is actually inside the courthouse. And the theory is, next slide, if the information in the self-help materials fails me on the small things, how can I trust it on the big things? Um, another barrier is keeping people motivated through difficult or lengthy processes. So when they've gone through a particular process, um, such as uh, simple consumer bankruptcy, um, in the first third of the materials, we show that uh, Blob has reached the first uh, flag. Um, when they're halfway through, they've reached the second flag. And then we celebrate when they finish a particular process. Next slide. Another barrier is anxiety. I mean, it, we know as lawyers that going through a process can be very stressful. So we suggest that people um, engage in deep breathing exercises, meditative processes, and so on. Um, the next barrier, we also recognize that there is a clear distinction between conceptual knowledge, next slide, and procedural knowledge. And in our materials, we focus on procedural knowledge. We focus on skills, procedures. We give them action sequences because so often people's first question is, where do I start? 
Um, we also recognized, as, as Quentin just noticed, that there are language challenges amongst people, low literacy, problems with information processing. So we used imagery that can be used to explain, direct, and even entertain self-help users. And in fact, there are studies that showed us, which kind of surprised us, um, that stick figures are more effective than detailed drawings or photographs because there's less distraction. Okay, so that's the, uh, the financial distress research study. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Princeton Debt Collection Lab. I know we have limited time. Um, so um, working with um, a number of academics uh, uh, headed by Fred Wary of Princeton, we have built a, uh, a tool that the ultimate objective is for us and it's forward pace facing, it's public facing, so the public understands debt collection as a process so that we can change it. Um, it is a horribly abusive and corrupt practice that involves a parade of sometimes shady characters, debt buyers, debt collectors that are complicit with, sm with the small claims court system. The small claims court system was never designed to be used in the way it is being used, which is you know, over 90% of debt collection cases. So we have uh, from various jurisdictions um, data that um, allows us to expose the process um, of this clear human rights issue um, and, and the fact that it is a systemic, uh, involves systemic abuses. This is also a very um, broad uh, type of project because we're also using the arts and different storytelling traditions to interrogate, transform, and spread new dignifying narratives for debt justice. And so in the next couple of slides, you'll see some wonderful pieces of art in the style of Jacob Lawrence that help to illustrate um, the debt collection process. We're also working on a documentary um, in the style of the New York Times Opdocs um, as an alternative to traditional uh, debt collection narratives. So that's the work that I'm doing um, with both of them. And then a little later on, um, I will explain some of the work I'm doing uh, at the Law and Innovation Lab at the University of Denver. Thanks, Lois. Um, my next question is back to you, Zach. Um, the ideas you sort of shared with us from other jurisdictions uh, uh, were really interesting, and I'm happy to hear more of them if you have them. But I also want to shift the conversation a bit and discuss hurdles. Based on your experiences, like sort of across states, what do you feel is the biggest roadblock to adopting access to justice technology from the point of view of the user? And do you have any insight on these hurdles in Rhode Island specifically? You're muted, was that another yeah, one? Yeah, that was my first time doing that in probably a year and a half, so it was bound to happen. <laughs> uh, I think a major challenge, it, it impacts the user, but, but I actually would put some onus on the courts for a lot of this because there tends to be this perception of technology as a magic solution to problems. Um, I think most technology when deployed intelligently is a tool like any other. And so ultimately what you're usually looking at is a process and how to improve that process and whether or not a piece of that improvement could be a technological one. When courts shifted everything online, there are some very serious access to justice benefits to that. Um, you don't have to take time off of work. You don't have to find childcare. You don't have to you know, wait around in a physical space for hours. Those are good things. But you can't just take an existing process of, say, a debt collection case, move the whole thing online without giving it a serious hard look about what that means for the user. So while there are benefits to that technological change and the advantage of being remote and that someone can appear from anywhere, yada, 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 you can't disadvantage someone who appears on the phone via versus someone who appears in person versus someone who appears via Zoom. You can't penalize people whose internet connectivity isn't good enough. You can't uh, end up giving someone a default judgment for failing to appear, even though they actually were trying very hard, but they mistyped the URL to get into the room because you didn't give them a link that was shorter than 25 characters. That's not good process, which in turn makes for bad results. Um, and we tend to blame or, or give credit to the technology, whether it's good or bad, when in reality, it's, it's the courts and the policy decisions that build those processes that can result in either good or bad outcomes. So I guess my first big lesson from around the country is if you want to do a tech thing, first look at your process stuff <laughs> because it's really not a tech thing. Usually what it is is 
how do we think about the system and how people interact with it? And then to, to the more pointed part of your question, that to me brings it back to the user, which is what, what is that user going to experience and what is this process like? And we talked a little bit in our last session about process mapping and user testing, all that still holds here. I think the other last piece of this I'll mention now is um, the contracting that results in these technological solutions is really complicated. And I think a place that all courts could do better is in thinking through those contracts before they're signed um, and understanding the data policies and rights and how that impacts their users, um, particularly as more and more technologically sophisticated solutions are deployed in the court space. You're going to see more and more longer term contracts and more and more technological uh, tools and vendors entering the space and the courts have to be on equal footing with them from a sophistication standpoint. You cannot give away people's rights to privacy or data without, uh, well, you shouldn't give those away at all, but you have to be very careful and make sure you're not inadvertently doing that. Um, we don't want to disadvantage people by giving them only the option to appear remotely or only online, leaving aside digital divide concerns, but as a result of that, then having to give away some other right. So I think that the, the opportunities are great, the stuff that we just heard about from Lois and from Quentin are, are amazing things that are, that are going to increase access to justice. My little example, there's more of things like that. But, but for me, the part that lies underneath all of that, that really is where we're at um, a, a dangerous and perhaps hopeful point for the whole court system is how are we going to make sure we're thinking about those processes, those data rights, and those contracting things so that courts aren't making decisions they don't fully understand and locking themselves into contracts that last quite a long time and the people that get punished ultimately or who are harmed ultimately are, are the users. Um, I think that's a really great point. I think there is, and someone said this, like sort of this idea that technology like comes in, it's a black box, it waves the wand and now all your problems go away and it really isn't. Right. Especially when what underlies that is the basic court processes to begin with. I have right. a follow-up question, Zach, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but when the courts engage in like the RFP process for some of these technologies, is user testing at that level engaged in? Or is it sort of the court picks a technology and goes with that, and there may or may not be user technology until after it's already built? I think unfortunately the user testing part isn't often built in, although it's not never built in. Um, I know that, oof, you're gonna test my memory. Uh, I think it was Washington State did a COVID related procurement process where instead of having an RFP and then receiving bids, they actually did like a mini sprint and they did user testing and demos and kind of had the vendors essentially say, here's what we think we could build for you. We did this limited version of it. And then they had a group of stakeholders, both internal and external to, and it's not the court, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the exact institution, but they tested it. And they did like a 45 day process essentially or it was almost like a little mini competition. And at the end of it, they got a product that was significantly cheaper and more robust in terms of features than they had rarely ever previously seen through their traditional procurement process. So I think what we're trying as the National Center to do with, with the courts as we work on this is get them to think about things that way. Maybe that's not the right process for every procurement step, but as your point, which is who is gonna be using this? Are we testing with them? How are we defining the needs and the goals and sort of the minimum viable features of this thing, not just us as court administrators or court technology officers or judges, but our user base. And as we previously discussed, many, many, many of those users are not lawyers, are not um, trained in being uh, part of these systems. And so you have to think about those people first and foremost, because if you, if you meet their requirements, you'll ultimately meet all the other requirements of the lawyers and more sophisticated actors. It reminds me sort of as like, of like wedding cake testing. <laughs> like you like go and buy a wedding cake without having tested it and tested other cakes first um because you don't know if you're gonna like that cake or if it's gonna work for you and so like maybe part of the conversation today as we go forward we can really think about when do we add the users in and how much that might benefit everybody in the system um my next question is for lois and quentin based on your experiences what do you feel is the biggest roadblock to A to J technology from the point of view of developers and institutions that support this, this work? I'll go to Lois first. Lois, you're muted. It's Friday afternoon. This is gonna keep happening. It's contagious. It's I started Friday it. I'm afternoon. sorry, Lois. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as Zach noted, I mean, one of the problems that, that 
I'm facing in my lab is that the systems are bad. And so we're trying to design around bad systems. You know, systems are bad, forms are worse. There's no uniformity even within a jurisdiction. So in Colorado, 64 counties potentially have 64 different forms for the same thing. Um, and it, so, you know, that's just a huge challenge. So, you know, we haven't overcome that. But there is the challenge of getting adoption of tech tools that are out there, um, gaining trust of the low and in, uh, moderate income communities that is inundated by for-profit scams. Um, programs like the one at Suffolk, like the one at DU are expensive to run. Um, I think there is a, um, a growing need for more tech-oriented lawyers um and that's starting to happen um there is an aging lawyer population that tends to be more risk averse vis-a-vis -vis technology um that's something i think we will age out of um things are changing just not terribly fast um another roadblock there's no central repository for all the tools that are being built um, it would, and, and then you've got the problem that if there was a central repository, something would have to be completely, if it was built for Colorado, it would have to be almost completely different for Rhode Island, for Massachusetts, for Washington state. So, you know, I, um, Stanford is got an experimental project where, uh, with, I think seven or eight pilot standardized forms, but standardized fields and Colorado is participating in that. So, um, I'm anxious to see um where that goes i mean there's no shortage of roadblocks so i will turn this over to quentin okay yeah so unsurprisingly i'm going to also echo the same kind of challenges they're really people challenges they're not tech challenges i think um tech is easy to some extent it's like a solvable problem you know once we get it right we can automate it but driving change is hard um, I think some of the things that tend to come up again and again in these projects, the ones that are easiest to do are the ones where you get to make all of the decisions <laughs> yourself, because it's really hard to get committees to approve tools that you've built. Even once you've said, this is the solution we're going to take, we're going to build this tool. There's some approval process, some vetting process before it goes live and um, getting agreement on what that end result should be is, is challenging. Um, kind of a surprising thing is people tend to really want these tools to be perfect before they go out in the world. Um, they, it's because it, it makes sense, right? Like you click publish, now it's there. You can see exactly how it makes a mistake and it will do the same mistake over and over and over again. But of course we don't hold real world attorneys to those same standards. So getting some consensus on what's the level at which we're okay releasing this tool, it's 80% of what we think it needs to be. It can cover those situations safely. And, and it's available any time of day or, or night. Um, so it, we should release it probably, right? And, and not try to get that last 20% of the features in that might double or triple the time it takes to develop it. But getting teams there to that point can, can be difficult. I think those are the barriers that I've seen the most. I think like one of the barriers that I'm aware of is like, the collaborative work <clears throat> with the communities of lawyers where there is some feeling that if we have free products that exist in the law space that that's directly taking money out of the pockets of actual lawyers who, who, who market rate lawyers um and so i see like a resistance to streamlining things and automating things and to making more free resources available because it encroaches in the what a real lawyer does and what is really legal advice and also can devalue existing lawyers. Um, I know that's a hot button issue and no one has to respond, but if someone wants to respond, I'd be open to a response. I can jump on it. I, you know, work at a law school. You don't have to worry about making enemies, but I won't really hear either. Um, I think Catherine Alternator, I was listening into her session earlier, said this phrase that I've heard people use a lot, which is practicing at the top of your license. Lawyers don't necessarily want to do all this routine mind numbing work that can be done by a computer. If it can be done by a com computer, probably 
there's some part of that process you can do that the computer can't, and that's what you want to spend most of your time doing. Um, the other thing is just look at the numbers. I, I'm assuming that came up with this conference, the LSC's report that just came out showed only 8% of people who face legal problems are getting assistance in court, 8%. The number's actually gone down from seven years ago when it was, uh, I think, 14%. So those numbers are abysmal. There's lots of folks who aren't going to hire an attorney who are in that pool who can use these tools. Um, and it could be a way, and I, I've seen lots of uh, small firms, small attorneys use these tools to avoid having to hire an, another attorney to at, join their firm. That's like a huge capital risk for someone to take paying a salary on an ongoing basis. They're building legal products that they can sell in the market to then kind of like this unbundled legal services idea, which I think also came up earlier in the conference. There are new market opportunities that come to lawyers who embrace these tools. And it's not actually very likely that they're going to be competing at the same place where lawyers are best suited to practice. Um, and if we don't have them, no one is stopping SRLs from coming to libraries. So there are these places that have traditionally helped SRLs that are still open and available, why can't we all just up our game um, in, a, in a meaningful way? Um, my next question is uh, on the library theme for Lois and then Quentin. Um, as a former librarian and always a librarian at heart, I'm always advocating for the use of reliable, trustworthy, and up-to-date legal information. How do users know your information is reliable trustworthy or updated? And how does this information, uh, it, how do you conceive of this during development of your products? So that's a great question. And um, getting people to trust and use tech tools is a huge challenge. Um, you know, I, I would say um, essentially uh, the tools that we're building in my lab have the imprimatur of a respected local law school, and we are working with nonprofits. Um, but it's still an issue. I'm, I'm actually working on an article where I'm talking about this. Um, and as for the issue of updating, um, we rely on our community partners to identify when a tool needs updating. Um, you know, I've been doing this lab for three years, which means we've built close to 30 tools, built or building 30 tools, and I'm not always up on every minutia of the law. Um, but we take responsibility for um, help working with them to help make the updates. Um, I have a, a TA whose job that is. Um, but I think the trust issue is a huge one. Thanks, Lois. Quentin, you're up. Yeah, I, similarly to Lois, the first thing that we do is we make sure every form that we build says who built it. So you can clearly identify the source of the tool, the source of the funding. Uh, if there is separate funding besides just the university's time and volunteers' time, and you can actually see the names of the folks who contributed to that form. Uh, the other thing on every page, you can click a button to see when it was last updated. So you'll you'll see some indication of freshness. I guess you, you don't necessarily know when the law changed, but you can see the form was updated last week. That's some indication of that question. And then the last thing is actually all of the code itself is available for free online. And that's something also available from within each tool on our about page, you can click a link to see the code of that tool and see who contributed to it and see the history of it and potentially the open tasks that there are to do on it still. But yeah, great question. I think really important to be able to convey that authority and, and safety to users. Thanks. Um, my next question is for Zach. This is my most hard hitting question. So get ready, everyone. Um, one of the concerns I've had raised within the conversation about A to J technology is that we're expending resources on developing these technologies, but we're not dealing with the fundamental issue. In other words, we're developing apps for those who can't afford lawyers instead of dealing with the issue that our country allows a system where the economically disenfranchised don't have access to lawyers for housing issues, family issues, medical debt issues, 
and other issues. Do you feel like we're skirting the real problem by engaging in the creation of access to justice technology? Uh, no, and I'd like to know where people think this magic supply of lawyers is hiding. I mean, we just don't have them. But there are many counties in Illinois where I used to work that have two, three, four, zero attorneys. So you could get them to do all the pro bono in the world. <laughs> there just aren't enough of them, right? I mean, it, I, I don't think that the supply is there and the lawyers are expensive to make. So I don't think of this as a diversion of resources. I think of this as a, as a response to the reality of the current regulatory scheme and the way in which we can make a meaningful difference in people who are going to come to court either way. So let's give them the tools and the resources and leverage technology as Quentin was describing, you know, let lawyers practice at the top of their license. There are lots of things these tools can do that can really help people. And if that's what they're going to have as an option until this magical supply of lawyers shows up, let's make those really good and let's make them user driven and user voice centered and, and test them and iterate on them. And like Quentin was also saying, let's not spend six years to develop something to get it exactly right. If you can get a minimum viable product that will handle 80 to 90% of the people problems that come across it, get that thing out the door, get feedback and then iterate on it, make it better. You know, th th there's a lot we can do and not all of it's tech related either. I, I think for some of these not as complicated issues with a simple process map that lays out in broad strokes what someone's going to encounter in their legal problem. And this is gonna take likely between six and eight months. You're gonna have to come to court a minimum of these number of times. At these steps, you're likely gonna have to pay. Um, you're going to need to bring these things to this visit. You're going to need to do this thing at this step, service the process, whatever. Does that equate to an attorney helping them? No, but if they're never going to get an attorney, like never, because there isn't one or there isn't anyone certainly offering free services. And these people who are dealing with this are never going to be able to pay 200 or whatever dollars an hour. Then giving them that tool that will allow them to at least navigate the system more effectively, give them a better shot at understanding the process, hopefully getting them better informed. That's not just good for the user in the sense of they have a problem they're trying to solve. It builds trust and confidence in the system. And it's good for the courts too. The courts should want these sorts of things because like the example of the traffic pass, nobody wants the people showing up at the counter with the wrong court, at the wrong court. Nobody wants that. That's the absolute worst outcome for every single actor involved in that. So we should do everything we can to prevent those sorts of situations from happening. And I think that given the reality of, of how legal uh, advice is distributed in this country. Um, you have to take an approach that includes legal tech and self-help materials and all the things that we've all been talking about and that I know you all are working on. Thanks, Seth. Um, so one of my goals today is to highlight, oh, Quentin, you want to jump in? Go right ahead. Well, I don't want to take away time, but if I had just one more thought, I just, I do question if what everyone wants is a lawyer for every problem, right? Like Good we point. don't go to a cobbler to get we might get the very best perfect fitting shoes if we go to a cobbler every time, but I'm much more content having that be a discreet 20 minute, go online and buy my pair of shoes or maybe spend an hour going to a store off the rack than getting them handmade and hand tailored for me. I think people experience that same attitude to some legal problems too. Thanks. Um, so uh, one of my goals today is to highlight the amazing work your community is doing. Um, would each of you be able to share one or two apps, forms, project, or resources you recommend for, for those trying to bridge the justice gap with technology? Uh, Lois, I will start with you, and I believe you have slides. So Whitney, yes. you bring up the slides. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Whitney. Um, so let's go on to the first slide. So uh, I've been doing this at... at do for three years. First year was remote and kind of a nightmare. Um, but fall 2021, I had 10 lab students partnered with five community partners, and we worked on five different projects. The um, next slide, Street Law Navigator, which I'm going to demo for you, um, a 
uh, forced labor advisor, the Colorado Housing Navigator, Social Security Benefits Denial Advisor, and a self-help navigator. Um, the next year, uh, <laughs> I had 12 lab students. We worked with three community partners to solve four problems. So I finally got smart. Um, this is what we're working on now. And in fact, our final presentation is in less than two weeks. Um, so next slide. Um, know your rights when your car is towed. Colorado has a predatory towing problem. Um, a mobile homeowner advisor. A lot of mobile homes are being uh, bought up by private equity and the um, residents don't know their rights. Uh, SNAP benefits denial advisor. The entire state of Colorado has one attorney who does SNAP um, denial appeals. And then uh, contempt in family court. Um, so I'll give you a couple of specific examples. So the um, Colorado uh, Legal Services, which is a phenomenal organization, gets tons and tons of calls about housing. Um, they range from questions about homelessness, uh, uh, imminent eviction, foreclosure, mobile home park issues, high risk tenant discrimination. Next slide. This is what CLS presents to them. Um, and we recognize, next slide, that individuals who come with a specific problem really only need the information that they can deploy to address their specific issues. So the Colorado Housing Rights Navigator provides tailored information, um, improving uh, with respect to tenants' rights, including improving credit profiles, warranties of habitability, security deposits, housing discrimination, evictions, and foreclosure. And I'll give you just a couple of screens shots what it looks like. So this is the first screen. Second screen involves diagnosis of the problem. And um, then and you can continue. And then these are, I'm sorry, this, I don't know what happened here, but um, provides detailed um, uh, remedies for just the specific problem. Okay, this is Street Law Navigator. Um, and this actually won second place in the International Iron Tech uh, competition sponsored by Georgetown Law. So um, our client was Dry Bones, which is a service organization for unhoused youth. And so um, the developers, uh, the two student developers of this um, determined after uh, literally going into parks, um, attending weekly dinners with um, the Dry Bones staff and what they call their friends, the, the unhoused kids, they uh, settled on five topics. Um, after talking to these kids, they found that they had trouble with the written words, so they decided to have peer narr narration. Um, it was designed to look like a video game, which is how a lot of these kids spent their time, uh, and included information such as how to save screens um, in the absence of data plans, which most of the kids didn't have. Um, next slide. Um, one of the other topics, tips for talking to police. Again, peer narration, pop-ups for explanations, a bullet list for what you can and should do. Um, the next slide um, helps helping kids uh, figure out what to do when they get a ticket. They have tons of interactions with the police. Um, they don't necessarily understand the difference between different jurisdictions, that the rules are different, the courts are different, um, and includes reassuring narration from a peer. Next slide. Um, this one tells the kids where they can sleep and what the local laws are. Um, addresses four Denver area counties, uh, which ones have street sweep policies, which jurisdictions are more friendly for camping, which are uh, less friendly for camping, which are uh, more or less family for, for excuse me, friendly for sleeping in cars. And then finally, legal uh, terms, legal words. Um, we found that the kids didn't understand the import of getting cited in different jurisdictions. They don't necessarily know what a summons means or what an appearance is. And so this is a translation into plain language. Um, next slide. Okay, so this was done um, in, uh, I believe, fall of 2020. Um, uh, for court ordered mediation, um, the students decided they were going to educate through using a cart series of cartoon videos. And they created this character that they called Blueberry. I don't know if you've been to Denver to see the convention center, but there's this huge blue bear. It's, it's really an adorable piece of public art. So it helps people apply for re reduced cost mediation, um, has a document automation um, tool and helps people find and uh, get paired with a mediator. Um, the next slide, 
was a little, this tool was a little different because the user is designed to be an attorney. So a lot of lawyers want to do um, pro bono work, but uh, the consumer work is outside of their area of expertise. So it helps the attorney identify the specific, specific type of consumer debt issue that the user, that their client is dealing with and provides the attorney with tailored legal information and resource networks. Um, next slide. Uh, CLS, Colorado Legal Services, turns away 50% of the people who contact them needing representation in a divorce. So this tool was built to determine users' uh, eligibility for an uncontested divorce, um, provides document automation for the necessary court forms, and provides a detailed, simplified, empathetic overview of the divorce process. Um, and finally, my last slide. Um, Colorado started an e-filing pilot for self-represented self-represented parties in nine counties. And what they discovered during the course of the pilot is that two thirds of the filers were having their documents rejected by the e-filing system. And it was costing them $12 every time they tried to file. Um, the two primary issues was people would take pictures of a six page document with their phone and try to upload each page one at a time and they would be kicked out. And they also um, had trouble filling out the caption correctly. So students built a tool that addressed these two fundamental problem. It completes the form through documents document automation so it can only be downloaded and then uploaded in a PDF and automatically creates a proper caption. So that's more than one or two. Sorry, Nicole, but that's what we've been doing in the past couple of years. No, um, I'm glad to see this. Um, so I've presented with all of you before and Lois, the dry bones project like speaks to me so much. And it's not one of those things where I see it and I think, oh my God, this is so complex. Instead, I see it and I think like, I could do that. Like clearly not as well as you, but like I could do that. Like we could do that here. We could start right now and work with local hospitals and work with uh, local nonprofits. And like, we could do that right now. And so to me, this is like so inspiring and such a great way to kind of end our day after hearing about how much need there is, but there are also solutions. Um, Quinn, do you have one or two you wanna share? Uh, sure. Yeah. Let me just do a little screen share here. Um, it's not fair. You can screen share and I can't. Sorry. Sorry, Lois. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So this is the site that I was talking about, the courtformsonline.org site. So what you can see here is where people would start. Um, you could either choose to browse by category. We know people don't always know what category their legal problem is in. So if I do something here like type help i my landlord let me try that my landlord is kicking me out of my house it will use a natural language processing tool built at at suffolk called spot to actually match that up with the category or taxonomy and here it looks like it's gotten health as the top category i think if i change those <laughs> terms i might get housing um, as a higher relevance. Uh, so then you get to the actual individual tools that we've built. And I'll show you one that I built. This actually isn't wearing my Suffolk hat, but it's wearing my, my wider hat. As someone who builds these tools, um, this is a tool called Up to Code. I described that briefly. And the focus of this is helping tenants document, report, and get action on housing conditions in their home. So I'll just show you a couple of screens. I go through here. I get to say a little bit about myself. I always like to be Jane Smith. This is something we learned from user testing and user focus groups, how top of mind that issue of thinking, hey, if I exercise my rights, my landlord is going to evict me was. So we had lots of places we wanted to emphasize that people can do this without being evicted. And then you just get walk, get a chance to walk through and indicate the problems that you have. This is kind of the first layer of this, just these top 15 categories. Um, and you get to provide a little bit more information, including a photo if you want. Um, but if you would like, you can actually explore this in the lens of the housing sanitary code. And this is what I said here, this has been translated into multiple languages, which is really exciting. 
Um, so people can actually explore and understand all of the rights that they have under the housing code. It can be a lot. And that's why we let people just start with those top most common categories first. But um, making this available and accessible to people is one of the things I'm really excited about. And then finally, I kind of described what we've been trying to do at Suffolk is to let people around the world build these tools themselves more quickly, more effectively, and more efficiently. So that tool that we built here, it, it, we have a lot of documentation. That's one of the products that we've been focusing on building the most is information to help people do this and replicate our process. So from how to set up your own team to do this, basic information about getting started, working through all of our tools. And then I, I'm really excited about all this content that we've built around doing a good job at it. So things about how to actually write those questions so they're readable, usable, and people can actually do it in a way that's respectful of them and easy to answer. Thanks. Zach, do you want to share a couple? Yeah, but first I just want to say I love what Quentin just showed. I think it really, to me, that's like among the most important pieces of all this stuff and goes back to our earlier conversation. The technology is sort of easy, but writing the questions well is really the key, right? That's that's what makes this whole thing tick. But I love that one. Um, I mentioned our, our traffic path in Wyandotte County, Kansas. You can see that it's, it's live, it's on their website. Um, and I think in a previous session, I mentioned our new plain language glossary which is designed well, so it's got a technical aspect to it, but it's as among the most basic of things. It's don't use this term, use that term. And it's got little cards, it's graphical, it's got examples to courts that have used the correct or better term as well as their form. So we're really trying to push that out. And then a companion to that that we just produced and released this, this last week is a gender inclusive language toolkit. Also focusing on how you as a court system or you as a lawyer can more effectively communicate accurately and respectfully to treat people with dignity. Um, we think that courts are working on this and they can do better. And especially as laws have changed, there is a need to update things for a literal accurate sense of need to update things. Um, but, but more than that, you know, being respectful of your court users. So these, these are the ones that are like underpinning some other stuff. And then the last thing I'll pitch is um, we do have a tool that will help you think through how to move from one technology platform to another. It'll help you ask those questions about data ownership and usage, about contracting, about some of the less sexy stuff. It's really, really important. And you can see it at ncsc.org slash exiting tech. It's a website that you can play with. It's a PDF you can download. And it is a physical, low-tech, actual booklet made of honest-to-God paper that we will mail you for free. So ncsc.org slash exiting tech. Think of it like a card game. You can ask questions. You can use it anytime you're moving around a technical system. And we called it exiting tech in recognition of the fact that many courts are transitioning from one system to the other. But if you think about it, almost every project you're doing that relates to stuff is moving from a previous policy or system to a new one. So it applies in, I think, every case. And it's a pretty fun way to do that kind of thinking. Thanks a lot, Zach. Um, Katrina or Whitney, do we have any questions that need answered? We currently do not have any questions in the Q&A, but if anyone in the audience has any questions, please put them in now so we don't keep our speakers for too, too much longer. Okay, well, I'll read my goodbye comments, and then if we get a question, I'll pause. Um, so I want to say thank you to our amazing panelists, not just for speaking with us today, but overall for the amazing, innovative, and inspiring work you all are doing. Thank you for always responding when I email you to do a thing and to speak with me. Um, I also want to try to take every opportunity I can to tell anyone who will listen that librarians are instrumental to any conversation about access to justice, especially access to justice technology. Thank you to all the librarians out there for all you do. You are unsung heroes, and now I will get down from my soapbox. Um, thank you to Whitney and Katrina and all the Law Review students currently on Law Review and formerly on Law Review, including Rachel and Sophie, um, uh, who worked hard and advocated to make justice for all in this event happen. Um, and obviously, thank you to our attendees. And now we have a question. Sure, so the question is, how do you test technology to ensure it helps? Um, I would say I've heard Lois speak about design sprints before, so maybe that would be a good place to start. And then if someone else wants to jump in after that. 
Um, yeah, so um, we go through uh, user um, interviews and user testing for every project, and um, we try to get folks who have in the past found themselves in with the problem that we're trying to solve. We're not always successful. Um, I remember so other if we're not successful with finding a specific person, um, we hang out in courthouse halls and ask people um, to try a particular tool. Uh, a team last year, I thought it was pretty clever, went to a laundromat um, because people are standing around waiting for their clothes to dry. And they got a lot of people to give them feedback. Um, as I said, the street law navigator developers um, went, went to parks and asked kids what would be useful and not useful. So yeah, we, we engage in a lot of user testing and um, significant changes are made. Um, actually, this is going on next week for, uh, for my lab um, as a result of getting feedback and that it's, it's invaluable and, and we like to refer to it as co-designing. Oh, God, well, yeah. We're having a nice uh, golf competition. I, no, I, I love that. I mean, if you want to know if something is helping people, ask them if it helps them, right? I mean, that that's that that doesn't get more simple than that and more effective than that. Um, a, a colleague and friend, Nigel Bomber, at the Victoria Law Foundation in Australia, has a perceived inaccessibility of court scale, which is a very simple survey, but really, really well designed. And it gets at some of these questions, like, are you being helped? Is this useful? And you can use it to test any kind of intervention. Um, and I think what Lois said is, is perfect, you know, just ask people. Um, and I, I think that there's the user design and user testing part of it on the front end, but then there's also the back end too. Same story, Did, was this useful? Just ask them, you know, on a scale of one to five, how, how much did this help you? Would you recommend this to a friend? That, that sort of stuff is, again, not expensive to, to deploy as a, as a research question sort of, but as a tool um, and to get those responses is incredibly valuable. Yeah, I would just say I agree. I think it sounds like what Lois, what you've been doing at your lab has been really like the gold standard. Um, I I like to distinguish between like focus groups up front and then usability testing. I, I Something I try to do is do observational testing. So I let someone use the tool and then watch them. And because you learn a lot from things, I ask them to narrate out loud their thought process, but they're things that they won't be able to articulate as being problems that you can see when you're observing and I really love this book by Steve Krug called Don't Make Me Think. I think it's really been influential for me thinking about how you use ability testing. So that's one you can look up yourself. K-R-U-G is how he spells his name. Um, and there, if you want to just kind of see, he actually has a video for free. You can see on YouTube of, of just walking through like 20 minutes how he does usability tests. It's really simple. And I think anybody can do that too. Um, it, just to add one more thing um, for the uh, financial distress, distress research study, when we were testing our self-help materials, we would ask the following question, which was really, really helpful. So I understand that um, you're not having any problem with understanding this, but how would someone who's not as smart as you um, view this particular either diagram or direction or something? And we always got really great information from that. Um, because sometimes people are hesitant to explain or say or reveal the fact that they didn't get something or didn't understand something. That's great. Um, we have one final question. What are the specific, this is from a professor here, what are the specific technology skills current law students need to have in order, current law students need to have in order to implement the types of solutions that you have been discussing? So I teach law students these skills, and it sounds like Lois that you do too. And I, we start from the bottom. Um, and by the end of the semester, they've built a tool that can do a useful thing in the world. So I don't think you need any pre-skills, but it's very learnable. And I think it can take a couple of weeks to get up to speed, but anyone can do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think problem solving is the, the hardest um, skill to teach. I mean, we, we use no code platforms. So um, we have used After Pattern, which I think is a phenomenal tool. We've used Joseph, um, which is uh, 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 creates chatbots. And then my students use Neota for their final presentation, which is more hard, harder to learn, but has greater capability. And yeah, most of them come in learning, knowing very little. And I'm, I'm not a software 
engineer by any means. Um, but uh, it's certainly doable. But again, we spend most of our time not talking about technology or working with technology. We spend most of our time problem solving and writing. All right. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, and uh, Katrina, I give it back to you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for the panel and for everyone for coming. Um, with the end of that panel, that concludes our symposium event. So on behalf of the Roger Williams Law Review, we'd like to thank you for spending your time here with us today. A lot of important topics were discussed, and we encourage you to spread this discourse throughout your own circles as we look inwards on how we as a legal community can start creating more accessible spaces. Um, I'd like to once again thank all of our lovely panelists and our amazing moderators. Um, Susie, Eliza, and Nicole, this event would not have been possible without your support and guidance. I'd also like to extend a thank you to Dean Bowman and Chelsea Horn for helping us with this event. Um, this symposium, as many of you guys know, celebrates the inaugural edition of Law Review's newest journal, Justice for All. The print edition of this journal will be released sometime in the spring, so please keep an eye out for it. Anybody interested in voicing their thoughts on how to create more accessible spaces or anything we've talked about today is welcome to submit a written piece for publication consideration. Please email us at lawreview.g.rwu.edu for more information. Um, any resources that were talked about in today's events will also be posted on our website, which we will make sure to share with all of our participants via email next week. Those of you guys who are receiving CLE credits will receive a certificate um, for your hours early next week as well. Um, in the meantime, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I hope you guys have a fabulous weekend and that you've enjoyed today's program. Thank you.